There is something to that. I mean, we've got health inspectors, and we ask them, sure. like, hey, where's the worst places to go? And they're like, you don't want to eat Chinese food ever. I like it. I, I love <laughs> it. I had some last night, honestly. <laughs> yeah, I got low mein in my belly. Right? The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Deer Grow. Heck yeah, man. Dude, we put a lot of food in the ground every year, you know, seemingly more and more, and uh, we have a ton of fun with it during the off season. Uh, there's some struggles that come with it too, though, right? Obviously, the back of my truck is evidence, you know, right now. It's mm-hmm. a couple of weeks after uh, I jackknifed, you know, a 4,800 pound uh, material spreader, you know, as I was coming down, and it's just it was too much weight for my truck there. But, you know, all those struggles aside, you know, dude, Deer Grill really has been a staple for our food plotting process uh, for several years now. Yes, we like to put lime and fertilizer on the plots, you know, if we can, but there are some that it's just we're not able to get to them or it's not feasible for us to get out of state with that stuff and so deer grow is kind of the the quick and easy but still super effective option for us to be able to get the most out of those food plots that we can every year and i mean we're guilty of over analyzing things just like everyone else but that's the best part about deer grow is that it's going to create healthier soils which in turn makes better food plots and the fact is is we can simply spray plot start or plot till when we put the seed in the ground and then when that plant starts to grow we hit it with boost we know that we walk away when we come back it's going to be a great looking food plot for anybody that's looking to try deer grow if you use the code hunter15 that's h-u-n-t-r-1-5 at checkout for deergrow.com and save 15 percent on any of your deer grow products it's a great way to get started on this and just see what the results are for yourself better food plots bigger deer and we're back hey on our podcast episode 171 nick keeps us in line Thank Continue. you guys for being here. We appreciate you. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, uh, YouTube, wherever you're YouTube. listening to us, we appreciate it. Um, give us a subscribe or a like or whatever is appropriate there. Um, also, anybody that's written us on you know Instagram or uh, some of them we see. I mean, if you're writing us on uh, Instagram, TikTok we or Facebook, we probably don't see those. But Instagram and yeah. the website, we read most of those. YouTube, so, two point. And YouTube. If we haven't responded, you know you know, appreciate your patience. Bear with us. We're, we try to get to those as, as uh, diligently as we can, mm-hmm. but sometimes there, there's a lot. So, but it, nonetheless, we appreciate you guys being here and yes. uh, we're excited to be here. So. Yeah. I, I think TikTok's probably the one that I, I didn't even know there could be messages. Through Me TikTok neither for a long time. <laughs> and People are like, like, you guys never, never respond to your TikTok uh, messages. I was like, what, not, what? what messages? <laughs> <They're> Tick <buried>. who? <laughs> <laughs> they're buried in there. I don't even see them. But. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're deep. So uh, it is, February 13th, day before Valentine's Day, guys. If you're listening to this, you missed it. Mm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's too late. Ah, it's too late for dude. you. It's I, tomorrow I'm, for us, so we got time. Dude, listen to this. So mm. I need I need your guys' opinion. Oh, well. So I, I've got lots of those. Probably like once or twice a year, I like I like to cook for my girlfriend. Wow, mm. once or twice a year, you cook well, for your girlfriend. Well, wow, she's spoiled, okay. Nick. <laughs> so there's the bar for all you fellas out there. <laughs> okay, okay. I, I do help in the kitchen quite often, but, you know, mm-hmm. just me. Mm-hmm. Just me. Just you. Just so, straight you, kid. Yeah. Just in the meat department. Yeah, it's usually her birthday and V-Day. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. So this year for Valentine's Day, mm-hmm. I'm doing something I've never cooked before. I'm doing uh, filet mignon. Whoa! Wow! Scallops. Mm-hmm. Don't burn it. Whoa! Oh, wow. Don't burn those either. Yeah, scallop or don't overcook them. They'll yeah. be rubbery. Asparagus. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Can't go Asparagus. wrong there. And then I can't decide between mashed potatoes, rice, or parsley potatoes. Ooh. I mean, obviously parsley. Yeah. You think so. Yeah. Yeah. All right. It's I Valentine's think, Day. Yeah. You yeah. think that's I'd a good B-Day so. meal? When you're talking parsley, you mean like roasted, like <laughs> cut up? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, mashed takes it down to like a Golden Corral level. Okay. You think that's a good meal, though? Yeah. For sure. I, it makes me hungry. Mm. Yeah, I'm hungry. Or a big one. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, or a whole, or a whole yeah. bottle. Yeah. I don't That's know. True. That's true. We're not filming Thursday. Yeah, whole bottle. Yeah. Hey, sky's the limit. Yeah. Wow. Speaking of which, I got pretty shit faced during the Super Bowl. Ooh, Did not plan on it either. Mm. It's one of those ones that sneaks. The brown water sneaks up. Bourbon. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah I drank a all. lot of rum on the beach, Ooh. dude. I I wasn't hungover once. Maybe. Really? Yeah. It's, Maybe did you just keep the drunk going? No. There's something oh. in our. It's the preservatives and stuff, I think, that they put in, like, our stuff here. Oh, that keeps you hung, like, make you feel shitty the next day. Yeah, because I drank a lot of rum. Mm-hmm. Was it, like, and I drank a lot local of, rum? Yeah. Uh, I can't confirm on all of it. Some of it was. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's hard to, it's hard to get, even, you know what, it's even hard to reach a point of, like, severe intoxication on the beach for me. Oh yeah, it's happened. Don't get me yeah, wrong; it's yeah. happened. But well, it's the heat that counter counteracts that. Too. Is it the heat? Yeah, I mean, I think that the heat 
that level of like drunkenness and heat gets to a point where like you just don't feel good about it. I don't think you can go too. You go too far over and you're in trouble. Yeah, yeah you you're, you're already clammy and sweaty and stepping on sea urchins and stuff. Yeah, and don't do that. Memories. Dude, one time I I lost a whole vat of rice that I ate like for lunch, and then on the way home, like on the bus, I was like. All over myself. Can you believe really? that? My wife was pissed. She had to basically take care of me. Yeah. Yeah, when you overdo it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember when I was in <laughs> high school, uh, my cousins and I went to the Bahamas, and we were we were like, whatever, 16, but you could, they didn't care. It was the Bahamas. Mm -hmm. You can buy alcohol. I don't think they have it. It was a great no. time. We built like a fire, and we were like shark fishing at night and stuff. Mm. And I remember it cost me like, Twelve dollars for a can of Copenhagen down there, oh yeah, because it was in like a plastic, because it couldn't be stuff's ridiculous. And I spilled it in the sand, and then I had to like, you know, because you can't just like, like it's cut. This is even better than glass. Oh like. yeah, it was it was a big <laughs> bit of griddle. And From here on out, you just spritz yeah. a little sand in your cope. Yeah, I mean, you just gotta can't just leave it there. It's twelve dollars. Yeah, so that was the end of the story. Cool. Yeah, nice. <laughs> nice, nice, I, man. I did nice. really step on some sea urchins that one time. Did you? Yeah. There was a lot of them. Wow. Where was that? Mm, Aruba? Aruba. Yeah? Yeah. I'm going to say Aruba. Sounds right. Yeah. I didn't see any yeah, in, uh, all kind of blend in Curacao Beaches when we were down there. There was a lot of cacti. It was Curacao. Yeah, it was Curacao. It was? Right. Because I had the trip booked the whole, for like yeah. a year. And I was like, yeah, this Caraco place looks sweet until I realized it's the same place I the week go. before. I was like, oh, you've been going here for years. <laughs> yeah. Curious house, how you yeah. say that? Cure. Swimmy, swimmy, swami. Don't, ask, don't ask me to find it on a map. But yeah, it's by Aruba. That's why you knew. Don't ask me to find that on a map. <laughs> South. I can find the Virgin Islands, but we were in the the BVI. Yeah, the, the, British, the British, British Virgin, Virgin Islands. Islands. Yeah, we yeah. would take a. You need a passport for that, huh? Mm -hmm. You need a passport for the U.S. Virgin Islands? No. No, it's the U.S. That's why I was confused. So St. Thomas, U.S. That's, or that's British? US. It is. Yep, because we f flew into St. Thomas. Right. And then took a ferry. Oh. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Yeah. What are the British Virgin Islands? Saint Virgin of the Virgin Islands. Yeah, but was it like St. Martin's? Is that a British Virgin? Tortola is where we're at. Yeah, I don't know that one. Tortola. Uh, St. Bart's? Mm, I think a lot of the saints are really? U.S. I think so. There's like something very St. Patrick, Virgin, gra Virgin Grande, Virgin Verde, oh, Grande green. Verde, something like that. Green and big. Yost Van Dyke, Yost Van Dyke, I think. Yeah. Wow. That's where like the soggy dollars at. That's where they mm. invented the painkiller. Had a lot of those. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. That's why you didn't have hangovers. Yeah, my pain was <laughs> killed. <laughs> killed. Sure. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. Uh, yeah, once you have enough of those, you yeah. start saying stuff like, oh, I'm, I'm not thirsty, but I'm in pain. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that'll do it. Idiot. Um, yeah, a lot of older folks, a lot of, you know, older vacationers, you know. Well, yeah, it was school year. Well, this is their busy season. Uh-huh, because everybody, time. all the northern birds fly south. All the, yeah, during the they, winter. Yeah, they don't want to be there in the wintertime. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was fun. So, yeah, it was a good trip. Did you fish? No, nobody was fishing. Really? Yeah, dude. I was like, man, if I lived there, I would have to, I, you know, there's no deer because this, it's like no. the bush. Like yeah. it's, it's dense. They have some goats. <laughs> they, they're a little more domesticated than I would prefer, uh -huh. but I probably would. But I mean, if you have been known to sink an arrow in a goat before. That's right. <laughs> it wouldn't be my first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A, lot, a couple goats, you know, they have a lot of chickens, like they call them yard fowl. So they're just like oh. free roaming, basically just wild. Interesting. We, I asked them, I was like, do people eat them? And they're like, eh, they kind of look down on you. Like if you're yeah. that desperate, like lot they of, judge you for uh, eating a yard fowl. A lot of like free range dogs down there. Yeah, I think most of them were like not free range, but yeah. they were like neighborhood dogs. I got a problem with dogs lately. It's just yeah, yeah. like be a responsible dog owner. Take care of your dog, you know. Like your dog, it's a family pet. I missed my dog. This a this lot. this free range like dogs all for themselves. They're gonna get themselves in trouble here real soon. It's all over the place. A threat sounds like a threat. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it is a threat. Yeah. No, it's called Kentucky. That's where it's at. Like I ran, I ran ten miles on Sunday. I had two different dogs chase me. What the hell? I will say it's. it's I'm gonna start carrying and just. 
I'll say it's pretty wild. Um, like the, the United States is just like so f- much further along. Like, yeah, I mean, in some ways we're what, you know, we've lost ground, I guess, but like, as far as like civilization, like yeah, building structures and yeah. towns and stuff, it's like, it's kind of super advanced compared uh, to that. Well, it's just, yeah, it was really black and white to be like, considering a lifestyle on the, granted a lot of those people, like our taxi driver and stuff was like, yeah, he's like, I live down here f- to taxi and then I I live in Georgia. Like this. <laughs> right? Wow. Okay. A lot of a lot of them go back and forth. A lot of them have kids like in Florida or mm-hmm. like here for school and mm-hmm. stuff or they have a spouse here. Mm-hmm. I, yeah, I don't know how many of them live there a hundred percent of the time. I'm sure some of them do. You see a lot of people fleeing. Like I know the guy that we ran it off of in Curacao, like he was like some tech guy in Boston and he moved down there, whatever, fifteen years ago and he loves it. I can. I can and I'm sure, like you know, if you brought like wealthy American money down to some of these places, like you're oh, you're there. a king. It's there. I don't know if it. Uh, well, dude, stuff is expensive. Oh yeah, it's because all the export stuff. Yeah, import export. I don't know if we had a, a meal for one person that was less than like sixty or eighty dollars. Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Jared's a big guy. <laughs> well, and obviously eating what everybody else is. Well, yeah. I mean, for four people, our the average dinner bill was like. Three hundred dollars. Wow. Yeah, because you guys weren't at a resort this time. I will say you? the food was really good. Yeah. Typically, you're not a fan. resorts yeah. and like a lot of the island stuff is like not mm-hmm. not great, right? Yeah. All er, almost everywhere we ate was real solid. There you go. So it is what it is. We didn't do an all inclusive, so the cost was kind of mm. offset there. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, it was interesting. It was not like. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, when you envision a resort, it wasn't that. It was like a hotel on a little beach cove. Yeah. That's kind of what it was. That's kind of cool. Yeah, it was neat. Hmm. It was neat. It was a good time. So you were on a boat. Yeah, for, oh, you saw it on yeah. Instagram, huh? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we went on a boat for one day or something. Yeah. Sailing around. Yeah. Your dad likes to be the captain. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure how to take that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, honestly, it was more, it was honestly kind of more stressful than it was. Real. I mean, yeah. if I drank enough rum, it was fine. You know, it was fine. But I was like itching to, there's work. I got yeah. work to do. And I got. <laughs> Dwayne fancies himself a little bit of a mariner. Does he not? A mariner? Yeah. Your dad? What's that? Like a sailor. Oh, a bit. Yeah. A bit. Well, he's uh, on the boat a lot. I know. I'm sure he felt. Did you have like a captain or did you like rent that boat? Yeah. No, Daisy was our captain. Oh. Daisy and uh, it was like the some something. The Ann Bonnie. It was like a sailboat. Mm-hmm. And they play like their little theme song as we pull out. And yeah, it was fun. We just yeah. drank more rum and <laughs> we're just on the boat. For Same a bit. Common trend. A little yeah. bit of, you know, Norkeland and. Yep. Uh, yeah. Is it good like coral and stuff there? I don't know, man. The coral seems to be. Yeah, on the decline. Poor spirits. It's just yeah. Yeah, not looking great across, across the board. Yeah. Maybe further out it's be- better, I would hope. But mm-hmm. I don't know, man. The problem is like, and I. I like to have an objective. Yeah. You know, like if I go somewhere, it's, I'd like there to be a perp, a mission. Mm-hmm. And I like to explore. So like, I want to be the first person. Yeah. That's why I like hunt trips yeah. so much. It's like, yeah. we're going to go there and, you know, kill a, a, an animal. Mm-hmm. And I'm, you know, granted there's people on public land yeah. and stuff, but it's, I'm there. I'm not following a foot yeah. trail or something. So vacations are tough for me. Cause it's just basically go and not accomplish anything. And just uh, do all the same stuff that everybody else is doing, like sightseeing, and so it's uh, it's kind of could take like a whatever a rutcation. Me. Rutcations are nice. Oh yeah, those are your favorite. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. That's my favorite. <laughs> I don't like those yeah. ones. Margie, we should do a rutcation next year. That'd be great. So yeah, it was kind of t- the whole time I was just like scanning the brush for d- domestic sheep and stuff. I'm like, you know, <laughs> what could you hunt? What would you do if you lived here? Nobody <laughs> was sitting fishing. there whittling a seashell to like knife a goat. What were you saying? You were gonna tell me something before uh, we started. About fishing? Whitetail adrenaline, I think. Yes. What? Where? Oh, yeah, I know. So I saw those guys up at Harrisburg. Yeah. That's the shirt. Uh, drank a beer with them. Yeah. Which yeah. we... Oh, wow. Yep. Nice. And uh, so Jared was telling me, like, we got, like, deep into the rabbit hole on, like, his stick bow, like, how mm. he hunts. Yeah. And first of all, he has 36-inch arrows. He, he basically, I don't know, puts two arrows together. I forget what you call that. But, like, it's... It's 36 How inches. How would you do that? It's, uh, what is that? Not lay. Scotch? Lay. Lay? Like <laughs> an arrow lay or something? I don't know. A lathe? Yes. And then like 
Let you used to whittle wood down? Wraps it and then uh, essentially sands it down and basically molds the two together. Stop. No, I'm serious. And then he Why? is prototyping. Uh, I'm not kidding. He's prototyping a 500 grain uh, broad, broadhead. Okay. For it. Like plus uh, the outsert system. <laughs> like <laughs> six, it's insane. So anyways, like what, we. What is it? Just a brick? Well, he, I thought he was like playing around with this thing. I mean, it was it was crazy. So we get into that, and then uh, one of the guys was like, "Well, you know how like Jared shoots, right?" And I'm like, "No, like I don't know." And it's like he like studied and read all of this stuff on like how the Mongolians used to shoot archery and were like the best archers, and and it's like all instinctive, like from the hip, basically. Like he never ain't like. There's no aiming. It's just from the hip and shooting. That's stupid. You ever been to Mongolian <laughs> Grill? No? Oh, that's a great place. Check yeah. that out. So she's from the hip? Pretty much. It's like it's above the hip, but it's like his anchor point is like the flex of his body to like where it can't go back anymore. And then mm -hmm. he pulls the last part of yeah. Well, yeah, so is ours, but we aim in addition to that. Yeah, there is no like looking at the arrow. String is, like, never even close to his face. Like, it's down here. Wow. Aren't the Mongolians extinct? Uh, I don't think they're extinct. <laughs> that sounds like it would be why. I don't think they're an animal. But, no, I mean, it's funny because, like, he... Who, who invented aiming? <laughs> it was, like... And, I mean, again, I don't know because I haven't... It's, like, he's got, like, all this research. Like, they were the best archers for this. And it's all, like, instinctive shooting. And, but, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, but it clearly not correct. Like we, I mean, are he pretty feels, dang accurate. He, with. he feels like he's pretty freaking accurate, like that. Now we're talking about stick bow, right? We're not talking about compound sure, or sure, anything sure. like that. Hmm. I don't know. Yeah, it was it was pretty interesting. <laughs> I'll probably bust out a stick bow at some point, just for you know, because why? Not? Maybe maybe even this off season, I would be intrigued yeah. enough to. I forget what he said. It give like, it a shot. Total arrow weight was like 800, 850, something like that. That's hilarious. And I don't know anything about a stick, you know, mm -hmm. you know, what would be required there, I guess. But I suppose, like, you're not as worried about, like, lob at that point. Well, it's it like you're it, only shooting 10 yards. Yeah, I mean, I 15 yards is my max with my stick bow. That's crazy. That's, like, nothing. Yeah. That's so close. So, like, yeah. And even then, like, you know, now learning lessons, like, you know, get it in the soft tissue. You don't put it in the shoulder blade. But I don't think he cares. He just shoots it wherever and that thing's gonna penetrate I'm just gonna, it i'm just gonna buy two of those crossbow pistols and walk around <laughs> have you seen them yeah oh yeah i'll just be like walk around uh, like tick, 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 yeah. holster them up so it was interesting because like i don't i don't even know how well i guess the rabbit hole came down when he was like showing me this arrow and i'm like the hell is this thing mm -hmm. and i was like is this two arrows together he's like yes i was like what <laughs> They like wraps it in carbon fiber and all kinds of stuff to like. That's ridiculous. It's it's nuts, dude. It's thirty six inches long. How long is a standard shaft? Like thirty, thirty one. No. no, it's gotta be longer than that. Right? I don't think so. Thirty one, thirty two. Like no, 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 no. How long do they come? Like uh, uncut is what I mean. Oh, I don't know. It's gotta be like. I mean, like your 34? your normal blanks that come in uncut are thirty two. I think. Is that what they are? Yep. Hmm. Okay. But yeah, I mean, this is this is two arrows put together. Interesting. So yeah, it was kind of a, a unique path. But anyways, that's the stuff you talk about in the off season, right? <laughs> anyways, anyways, uh, uh, we do have a guest today. We do, we do, and I'll it'll let be, you introduce him. Yeah, it'll be cool to get down. We talk about you know these are the things we talk about in the off season. Um, you know, I know this guy's a big trapper, uh, so that's mm. something that we can definitely get into. Re I mean, that you know. This time frame, people are thinking, you know, what do I speaking do now after dogs. the hunting season? Mm -hmm. Speaking of dogs, we'll ask Randy's opinion on that. Mm -hmm. uh, but we got Randy, Randy Bird's song on. Um, definitely interested in hearing more about his property down in Missouri. You know, kind of what uh, what those guys have really been working on. And uh, I mean, this the, is the Raven Project. The Raven Project is where yeah. the property. Okay. Yep, in southern Missouri, and so you know that has been something that the, I know those guys have put a ton of effort into, and you know, at least following along some of the social and stuff that these guys have done. Like, I mean, they definitely are seeing some really good bucks starting to show up, but you know, I, I'm pretty sure they're close. If not in a CWD area, be interesting to see mm. if they've been seeing any EHD type stuff. Um, but yeah, so Randy, we've, we've known Randy for quite a while and i um, happy to get him on and, and talk a little bit and see what he's got going on there in old Mizzou. Formerly seen on, I don't know. Headhunters. Currently, but yeah, Headhunters TV. Yep. 
at Hunters TV with, with Nate Hosey. Very cool. So, anyways, bring in Randy. The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Rack Hub. Well, dude, sheds are starting to hit the ground. Yeah, and although we usually don't find many of them, we've done pretty well this season so far. I would say for just, you know, a handful of walks, we've got a pile of sheds to show for it. For, so, yeah, I'm, I'm excited. Yeah, I mean, if shed season would end today, I think it was pretty successful. So this year, we're partnering with Rack Hub. It's an antler mounting system for your sheds. Yeah, and obviously, people have watched our podcast. We've got this massive pile of sheds that are on the table at all times. But you guys took the time to set up Wide Boy Shed on the R1, which is a really cool way to now have that thing right off to my left-hand side during the podcast. So some of these sheds just call for a little bit more appreciation, I guess. So rather than being up on a pile on the table, you know, we're going to mount them on the wall, and, and they look awesome. So Yeah, and so if anybody wants to try Rack Hub, you can use the code Hunter10, H-U-N, tr 10 at rackhub.com to get 10% off your order. Use Rackhub to make the most of your shed season. What's up, fellas? All so, right, sorry, brother. Dude. That was longer than usual. Yeah. We got on a <laughs> I thought I was getting punked there for a second. Yeah. I'm like, you don't even want me on there. Or they just, they, what are we, sorry about what that. What are we doing here? No. I want to go to Mexico or sorry about wherever that. we're going. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. We should just bring them in. <laughs> we, we get, we, we get kind of rabbit holed on some of those things, and then you never know where it's going to lead. Dude, speak, speaking of the length of podcasts, like my wife all the time is like, how do you talk for three hours? I know. Like, and truthfully, because I've had other people ask us to be on, and they're like, well, we do them short, like half hour, hour. I'm like, I, I don't even know how to do that. I don't, I don't know how I don't know how I could condense a conversation. How do I compact it all into hour. that? Yeah. <laughs> Especially about deer hunting. Yeah. So, well, Randy, wel- welcome. Appreciate you joining us today. Oh, shoot. I'm, I'm glad to be here, man. Thank you all for having me. So, uh, dude, you're in, we're, you're in Southern Missouri, right? I am, yep. So, Randy, do you consider yourself a Southerner? Or a yeah, Midwesterner? Yeah, I mean, I do. I, I, I'm more, I'm, I'm more South. I, I feel like I'm, I've got more Southern in me than, than Northern. <laughs> but we're like, right, you know, we're kind of right where you could go, you could go either way. I mean, you, <laughs> it's kind of, kind of your choice. Shapeshifter, huh? Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, dude, you're, you're also, you know, a couple stone throws away from Kansas as well. That's right. Yep. Yep. We're right in the middle of everything, man. It's hard a lot to, of rednecks and hillbillies down here. I can tell you that. Yeah. It's hard to like fathom that, especially when you think of a state like Missouri, because I think most people from a whitetail side don't think Ozarks unless they like watch the show Ozark. Right. They think like a hundred percent. No, that's what. Yeah. I mean, I tell everybody, I feel like we're in the butthole of big deer country right here i mean seriously in a good because way if you think about missouri you never you never think about southern missouri you yeah. know it's always everybody northern wants to missouri. think about northern missouri you know southern iowa western illinois you know kansas on the other side but southern missouri just it, it's 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 an afterthought you know and mm. because we've always our deer numbers are good but it's always it's always a stretch here to grow a big deer we just we got a lot of things, really everything going against us in this part of the state. So it makes it tough, you know, and, and even what we're doing with our property and, and, you know, the people that's kind of followed along with what we've done on the Raven project and stuff. I mean, it, we're, we're trying to polish a turd as much as we can possibly polish it. But like I tell everybody at the end of the day, it's still a freaking turd. <laughs> that's a you know what good mean? way to put it, man. Yeah. I'm, yeah I'm, I mean, for real. How, how much ground do you guys have down there? Can I ask that? Well, so the place that the place that we own here, um, in one chunk, we've got about twelve hundred on it, and then we lease another place down the road that's not connected, and we've got about another nine hundred down there. So we've got wow. we've got all together just just over two thousand, but not all continuous. Okay, yes, yeah, quite a bit. Yeah, gotcha. And yeah, but like I said, it's you know, and it's different. It's different here too because it's all relative, right? Like. When yeah. you think about big deer and hunting and stuff like that, it, it's completely relevant to where you are. And it takes more ground here to try to find a higher caliber deer, if that makes sense. We just don't have, you know, the, the as far as the percentage of our deer that ever make it above 140 as a mature deer are very slim. Hmm. Like, wow. and you go, you know, and that's what people, you know, they, it's, I tell people all the time, it's like, we can't compare what we're doing here to what people are doing in Southern Iowa, because you're not comparing apples to apples. Right. You know, our deer, I'm, I'm looking, you know, I'm looking and have my sights set on finding 150 inch deer every year. And if I can find one to hunt, I feel like I've done something, you know, I mean, because 
it's just a very, very, very small percentage of our bucks, even at five and a half and six and a half, like I said, ever top 135. It's just, they're just hard to find. Hmm. So what brought you to that area? I mean, was, did you know that going in? Are you from there originally? Uh, yeah, this is, this is where I'm from. I mean, I, I grew up here and, and this has always been home for me outside of, I lived in Southern Illinois for about six years while I was going to college over there. And, uh, you know, I was fortunate to manage some ground and stuff over there too. And, but it's, it, like I said, I mean, to me, I don't know, I'm always the type of person too. I, I maybe I'm weird, but this is where I'm from. So this area means the most to me. And, and I know it's an uphill battle, but, you know, I also tell people all the time, I mean, honestly, I get more of a thrill and more excited about shooting a 130 or 140 here as I would a 180 somewhere else, just because everything that we do here and the success that we see, I know is from the hard work that we put in, you know, all year and, and the last few years. So I know like anybody that's, you know, out there listening and stuff like that, they know what I'm saying whenever I, you know, I say that whatever you do on your own ground, it doesn't matter where it's at, you know, cause it's, that's all relative to where it is at. Mm -hmm. it, it just means so dang much more to you, man. Yeah. No, that's crazy, man. Cause I think what, you know, when people obviously like, if you said, yeah, you know, I am, I got property in Missouri, like immediately people gravitate to that, that Northern Missouri looking like Iowa type mindset when, you know, in reality, especially when you talk about the Ozark region and stuff, I mean, those are, those are big timber bucks that are, that are not only tough to, to grow, but tough to, to find it in, in a lot of cases too. Man, I think, I think it's the toughest. I tell people all the time, I mean, honestly, and, and not just because we're here and, and this is what we have to work with, but I truly, you know, being blessed to, you know, the last 20 years to get to hunt, you know, literally all over the country, you know, I, I really have a lot to compare it to. And, and I truly think that, you know, killing a mature buck here is as, as tough as it gets, you know, and, you know, growing up, I mean, I didn't have private ground to hunt. I mean, I grew up hunting public ground and, and hunting public ground here in this part of the state. So, you know, even though it was tougher, um, I really appreciate, you know, those experiences and stuff because I, I feel like it makes you a better hunter at the end of the day. And it really teaches you how to be a hunter when you don't have other, you know, benefits to rely on, so to speak. So um, it kind of, it kind of gives you that grassroots, you know, start. And I mean, I wouldn't change it for the world because honestly, I, you know, and, and not to sit here and say that I'm any better of a hunter, you know, than anybody else out there. But I, I truly think that it definitely helped me and mold me into the hunter that I am for sure. Yeah. Uh, so if the goal is mature deer, I mean, what, you know, obviously you guys have quite a bit of acres to be able to do it, but are you successfully getting deer to, I mean, what's the goal Four or five older? So we try to, you know, kind of our, kind of our plan. And this is just, this is just me and, and kind of my personal goals. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and tell anybody like, you know, what they need to do or, sure. or, what the right thing to do is. Cause I, I think that's all relevant too. I mean, I don't, I don't think there's a cut and dried answer on that. It's just for me, I, I really get in, I really get into the management side and even more so than the hunting side and the, and the killing side anymore. I, I get more personal satisfaction out of that side as I do hunting. And, you know, I, I kind of uh, here, you know, obviously our goal is because we're not, we know we're not going to raise a ton of super high end scoring deer, so I kind of I kind of base it more off of age age structure and try to get the age structure up to where you know we've got a lot of mature deer and we're we're picking off the five and a half and six and a half year old deer each year. That's that's kind of where we set our sights. And I ain't gonna say that we don't you know slip up and shoot one that wasn't on the list and we probably needed to get a year or two too whatever. But at the end of the day too, man, you got to remember. I mean, I think some people have kind of taken the fun out of it, you know, when you talk about that, because it's like, oh man, shit, shot a, you know, four and a half year old, it's the end of the world, you know, it's the end of the world. And it's like, guys, you know, I mean, what are we doing here? I you know, know, is man. it really that big of a deal? You know, the, the Joe Blow down the street over there, him and his family killed, you know, 12, two and a half year olds. It, it really, in the grand scheme of things, it's going to be okay. Yeah. Well, it's funny that, you know, uh, I really think that a lot of it, to your point, kind of sucking the fun out of it. It comes down to, you know, really the weird element of, of human nature, which is like it's it's peer pressure is what it comes down to. It's the fact that like, you know, maybe deep inside they're ecstatic that they killed that four year old or whatever. But the the perception that they know that they're yeah. going to get is is what 
kind of makes them feel that way. And man, we've been talking about that a lot, Randy. And it's a tough if it's it's a tough spot because like. I mean, obviously, if you are good eating tag soup and you only want to kill five and six year old bucks and like not shoot any more four year olds and like, you know, more power to you. But at the end of the day, kind of roping people back into that setting of the fact that like, man, you killed a four year old buck. Like, I'm sure it was an awesome hunt or what you, you enjoyed it. You immediately go to this like justification of like, I messed up, you know, and that's just such a tough place to be in anymore. It's, it's, it's bad, man. And, and, and honestly, I, like, I feel like it has gotten such to the extreme that it's really driving people away, you know, certain people, because certain people, you know, and a lot of, a lot of the hunters, they're not, they're not fortunate enough to maybe have and be able to do what some of us are able to do. So they all, they, they feel inferior, you know, when really that's how, like, for me, that's how I grew up hunting. Like I, shoot man if you're excited about it shoot it and like i feel like that needs to be kind of the switch instead of oh well you know he's got to be five and a half or he's got to be 150 or he's got to be 180 or whatever like Mm -hmm. i feel like we've set ourselves up for failure by kind of molding people's minds into thinking that way when in reality i think it, it needs to be more about what does that animal mean to you because at the end of the day like if it means something to you and you're fired up and you're pumped up, hey, that's what got us all into this to start with, you know, by all means. Like, I'm not going to sit here and tell anybody what they should shoot or what they what they shouldn't shoot. Me, you know, I've got personal goals. Like I said, just because that's, you know, it's 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 property that I put together. And for me, that's that's what I'm more into is the management side and making the property as good as it possibly can. And just for me, I want to see what that potential really is. And that's, that's the only thing that differs from my strategy or, or my goals than the normal guy. Like I'm still as relatable. I feel like as anybody, because if that one fifteen comes by and, you know, I'm fired up and I think, you know, he's, he's a mature deer or something. I'm fired up, man. I'm shooting, you know, yeah. like he don't have to be one fifty. Yeah. Um, so I, I think it just goes back to, you know, really there's a, there's a, I feel like there's been a loss of respect too for animals. And when you solely are hunting based off of what that animal scores or man, every deer we kill and put up on social media this year, it's gotta be a booner. It's gotta be a booner. You know, like you're losing a little bit of respect for the animal and and what you're doing. I feel like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's the biggest piece is like, you know, um, we talked about it a couple weeks ago where it was like, man, as crazy as it seems is it's like, you know, it's almost like big bucks just don't matter as much as they used to be, man. When somebody killed a 170, I mean, that thing was mystique. It was a giant, like everybody oohed and awed over it. Now it's like, we're, we're fairly numb to it. Cause we see them, oh, 100%. we see them all the time. People are killing them or posting trail camera photos. And it's just, you know, that, that big mystique kind of cool buck. It's like, what's it going to take now? Does it have to be a 200 inch to be cool anymore? Well, and you're, you're talking about, yeah, like an overexposure to sure. all you see is booners, right? Or, yep. or 200 inch, you know, whatever. And Randy, like what you're saying is, and I, it's kind of a different thing where, and we catch ourselves even just, uh, because we see so many mm-hmm. deer, like, and the trail cameras, frankly, is, is what it is, but there's an element of, what we see online and stuff mm-hmm. too, but it's like, you know, I'll see like a, a four year old one thirty five, and I'm just like, eh, eh, yeah, yeah, you know, and, and you yeah, see him so scrolling. often and you take for granted. Right. Cause when you see him in person, you're like, duh, duh, yep, 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 scrambling yep, for your yep. bow and whatever. But yeah, yeah, we definitely have an element yeah. of like, uh, not, not intentionally, but like, you know, la- a lack of respect for deer. Cause just, we're so, yeah, we I mean, see them all the time and we mm-hmm. see what's put it online and we're like, well, it's not that. So, no, no doubt about it. I mean, it, the prime example this year, you know, I, I shot a deer here on our place back in early November and uh deer I called butt sniffer. And he was a, he was a six year old deer and I had all the sheds off of him for the last few years, but he was like 140 inch eight pointer, you know? And I, I remember how pumped I was whenever I got down there by him. And, you know, one of the things I said, you know, in the recovery is, you know, he's not 180 inch deer, but we're not in Southern Iowa either. We're in Southern Missouri and He's a six and a half year old, you know, probably 140 inch eight pointer, you know, people, people go their whole life and don't shoot a deer like right. that, you know? And, yeah. and it's, you know, for me, I mean, I can promise you that deer was just as smart and just as hard to kill as a 180 inch deer 
that was the same age or, you know, whatever in Southern Iowa. Like it's, it's, it's so relevant, like I said, to where you're at, because it's, you're still hunting mature deer and mature deer, they don't get mature by being dumb. And, and, and it doesn't matter what part of the country you're in. If you're hunting mature deer, man, they're, they're still just as smart, no matter, you know, if they have 40 or 50, 60 inch less horn on top of their head. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's the big thing is like, we get into this, uh, this mindset, you know, of, of, chasing and i mean i think that's why we consistently talk about chasing mature deer and like that's our goal is because ultimately you know there's a ceiling on on the antler quality right i mean we talked to andre de Quista who constantly was like i'm chasing score chasing score eventually kills a 220 it's like where do you go from there right you, you there yeah. is no way at least with the mature buck side of things every one of these bucks has like a a cool personality they're all different like you can consistently chase and set expectations to that but I think a lot of it, you know, also kind of comes back to like, what, what's the hunt? Like I, I killed a three-year-old in Kansas a few years ago from the ground, called him in with my mouth from the ground. And it was like one of the coolest hunts I've ever had. I, I think it's relatively doable, you know, in terms of managing those expectations and like striving for goals when it's just you, right? Yeah. I think it, it becomes far more complicated and, and Randy will be able to relate, you know, when you're managing a property, like, and you have, you know, your goals, uh, you know, are translated to the property. And so I'm sure you have guests and stuff. And so you, you ask them, right? Hey, as guests of our property, you know, we'd like to see you do this, but I'm sure you also would like to just see them be happy with whatever they want to shoot. So there's, yeah. a, there's a tough element there yeah. of like, especially if there, there really is, man. Are, yeah. There but, really is. And, and when you're managing a property like that, you know, I mean, we, we need to shoot more than, you know, the two bucks that I can shoot personally a year off of it. So you have to <clears throat> you have to rely on guests and different people that come in and hunt to kind of help you meet those goals. But then just like you said, it's like it's like a weird fine line there of you don't want to take the fun out of it for someone, but also it's it's important to what we're doing and our in you know, our end goal. So yeah. you gotta have uh you gotta have people that's willing to cooperate, you know, and like I said, it, it's just it it does make for some awkward situations. Sometimes, you know, because you, you, you don't want to make anybody mad. You don't want to take the fun out of it. But um, I don't know. And I don't know what the right answer is to that, you know, because I take yeah. it too serious sometimes, too. I'll be the first one to, to tell you. Oh, yeah. Well, you can at least boss your brother <laughs> around, right? You have the permission to boss your brother around. So that's easy. Exactly. And he's usually he's usually the biggest problem. It usually isn't the regular guest. It's him that shoots all the three-year-olds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. It's it's one of those things that... um you know, when we, we kind of think about it from a property standpoint, and I think it's probably because like, especially the three of us, man, I enjoy managing the property as much as I do hunting anymore and, and growing deer right. and just, you know, being able to say that there's a five-year-old on this property. Then at the same time, like, I don't want to take the fun out of it, but I don't want to ruin that progress necessarily either. Well, it's like if, when it happens, it happens. The deer's dead. Yeah. So at that point, you might as well celebrate. Yeah, you can't harp on it. Yeah, it's not going to do you any yeah. good. Yeah. No, that's that's a tough spot to be in. So Randy, you you know you obviously grew up there. You cut your teeth there. I mean, when you know we we get this kind of question a lot, but when you were I guess getting ready to to think about like the Raven Project and and buying, like what what were you looking for in a property? Was it sure you know purely size? Were there any location or elements that you were looking about for that thing? Yeah, I mean, really, it was it was kind it's kind of complex because, you know, what we deal with here is, you know, you got to think about property value. You got to you got to think about like your return unless because, I mean, unless you're the type of person that's got enough money in their pocket to just say, hey, you know, we're going to shell it out. And it doesn't matter if it you know, if it makes a dollar like I wasn't in that position. So I had to try to come up with something that I felt like was a good um, investment from that standpoint outside really of the hunting too. So I was kind of looking at it from a hybrid approach and here, you know, the value in property here is, is timber. Yeah. So we got a lot of hardwood timber here in this part of the country. And, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of properties, that's the only, that's only the, really the return on it that you have, uh, just like this property. I mean, it had, when we bought it, it had 100% timber on it. So it, it, you know, it was, it was basically, you know, 1,200 acres of solid timber, not an opening on it. Mm -hmm. But whenever I looked at it, I saw that it had a lot of a lot of good timber. You know, it, for hunting wise, it was it wasn't the best property. 
But for an investment standpoint, I felt like there was enough value in timber that I looked at it kind of from a hybrid approach to where it really, from a management standpoint and a habitat standpoint, it needed timber harvest done on it to improve the hunting. So I looked at it as, man, I can go in here and, and, and get this property picked up and kind of kill two birds with one stone because I can pretty much, you know, help pay for the property off of the timber I cut. And while I'm cutting the timber, improve the habitat. So that's kind of what I looked at and looked for whenever we first started, uh, you know, looking because like I said, if you go in in this part of the country and you buy a piece of ground that's already been cut, really, unless you have the cash on hand to pay for it, you have no way of paying it right. off because you don't, you don't have ag ground that you can rent out. You don't, you know, you're not farming it. You don't have pasture that you can rent to run cows on it. I mean, really it's just a dead, it's a dead investment besides from the hunting aspect. So it was kind of a really, you know, a unique situation. And, and I would encourage, you know, anybody that's looking for property to look at it that way, you know, because it really helps you allow you to be able to, you know, maybe buy a bigger property if you look at it in that regard and figure out, you know, man, how can I accomplish all my goals, help get this thing paid for and still improve the hunting? Yeah. It's not always the easiest thing to do, but in this case, you know, I felt like, um, I felt like we could do it. And so far it's worked out. It's worked out pretty good. Mm -hmm. When you walked into that from a timber standpoint, like Jared and I talk about this all the time. It's like, you know, we, we spend a lot of time in the woods, but like, we're not timber guys. So like when we go through, we're like, yeah, that's a good black walnut or this is a good white oak. Like, did you have somebody with you to do that? Or did you eyeball it and just kind of say, well, looks like good hardwoods. Like there's probably some money here. Yeah. A lot of it we did ourselves. I mean, I've been around timber quite a bit, you know, my whole life just kind of um, and I try to educate myself as much as I can on that kind of stuff. Cause I kind of find it interesting too, you know? So, um, I knew right off the bat that it had a good, you know, hardwood mix. It was primarily hardwoods, probably 90% and probably 30% of that was of that 90 was straight white Oak. So, you know, from there, from there, I just kind of, uh, you know, got a good average on tree size and, you know, was able to put together some rough numbers as far as board foot per acre. And then kind of knowing what that market looks like, gauge what I could get in return off of that. And like I said, you know, I think that's a huge, you know, talking about timber management and, mm -hmm. you know, selling timber and cutting timber and stuff like that. I think that's a huge misconception. I know it was for me a long time ago, too, as as to how that can help and not hurt a property from a hunting standpoint. I mean, used to. I thought a chainsaw man was the devil. Like I thought it was the devil. I thought, you know, you bring a chainsaw in here and you start cutting timber, it's going to ruin the hunting. When in reality, honestly, it's about 180 degrees away from that. You yeah. know, I think, a, I think a chainsaw can do more for, for deer management and habitat, man, than, than just about anything. Yep. Um, as far as improving what you got there and, and what you have to work with naturally. I was just telling Jeremy <clears throat> on a conversation we had this morning, I was like, essentially, other than mass bearing trees and like uh, tree stand trees, you're it, from a, from a purely from a recreational like habitat standpoint, you're better off just to clear cut it. <laughs> you, don't oh, need, you don't need trees. They live dude, this, this tall. A hundred percent. And we've seen it here because we've went in and we've went in and done some sample plots to where we'll go in and cut and clear cut anywhere from, you know, five acres to 40 acres. And man, you know, it just opens everything up. The browse is so thick in there. I mean, it's it, it habitat wise, it's it's unbelievable. And you can tell within two years exactly how how good it is because you can tell how how the wildlife's using it. And I mean, it'll be a dang, it'll turn into a sanctuary. I mean, the the wildlife from you know from your birds to your rabbits to you know uh, turkeys nesting in it to to bedding area. I mean, it's 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 just solid, man. Mm. And, um, you know, this property, when we looked at it, you could go anywhere you wanted to go down through the woods and, and you know, hit a, hit a road or whatever. And you could look and see 200 yards down through the timber. I mean, it was wide open yeah. and everybody, you know, some people's like, man, that's, you know, that's beautiful timber, man. I, you know, I really like that. And, you know, we're going to hunt that and stuff like that. But man, as far as from a hunting standpoint, it doesn't get much worse than, than no. wide open timber like that. <laughs> Yeah. And it's so it's so funny, like what we've seen over the years of owning this place, because this was like the fourth year. So we went from the first year of it all being wide open timber and I and with no food, no food plots, nothing. And I bet we only were housing probably 20 to 25 deer on this place on thousand acres. Wow. I mean, 
a lot of deer used it during certain times where, you know, in the fall and the, you know, acorns started dropping during the rut, you know, it was a pass through place. So we would have a lot of deer in and out, but as far as deer living here, I bet we only had maybe 25. And within two years, we went in, we cleared out, you know, 40, 50 acres of food plots. We put those in, we put in some clear cuts, you know, probably 80, 90 acres of, of clear cuts and bedding areas. We've done a lot of hinge cutting. And I bet now I bet we're housing 150 to 200 deer on this place. Holy so cow. in, in, two, in a two year period, we saw it go from not having enough huntable deer to too many. So now, now we've shifted gears and now we're actually thinning does just to cut down the mouths that we have because we don't have, we can't grow enough food for them. Hmm. So it's it, very interesting, you know, and a very, very interesting from, from a management perspective of seeing how quick it can go. Like I said, from not having enough deer to having more deer than you know what to do with. Hmm. In some ways I am envious of that. Cause it's like, it, it's frankly a lot easier to cut stuff down than it is to plan it, you know, and I'm coming from like an area in Eastern Ohio and like Jeremy and I've got a farm in uh, West central Illinois too, where it's all ag. It's just completely open. Right. And, and so we're dealing with like, you know, okay, so what do you do? Do you just burn it off and like, mm -hmm. you know, hope that it springs back? Do you plant, you know, like a switchgrass planting? Is there, you know, you get into that whole, uh, you know, network of ideas, I guess. But like ultimately, yeah, it'd be nice to just go out and, and clear cut it. And that would, you know, that would essentially accomplish what I'm trying to accomplish with planning. Yeah. And stuff, the tough, the tough part is, especially when you get into like food plots and stuff in those areas, like if you don't have the equipment, it's expensive. It's expensive it's to expensive. clear a clear couple, like a two acre food plot is not cheap to clear. And the other <laughs> side of it too, is like yeah. tr traditionally you find your bigger deer in those, I think more open area, like bigger, antler sure. deer, you know, better soils equals yeah. big, bigger deer typically. Yeah. So you're making that yeah. sacrifice as well, being in a strictly timber area. Mm -hmm. No, no doubt. And I think too, you know, to your point of, of finding bigger deer in more open country, I think a lot of that goes back to is, you know, obviously nutrition, but part of the nutrition factor is, is density. Mm -hmm. And I think the more open country you get in, you know, your density is less. And I think that we, we, we deal with that hardcore here because you can really see it. I mean, it's no different than walking into a stand of timber, you know, when, when you have too many, when the, when the basal count is way too many, you know, stems per acre, your trees are suppressed. And yeah. I look at that versus, you know, the wildlife standpoint, you can see the same thing in the deer herd, you know, when you, when your density is too high and your food, you know, your food availability is too low, it, your deer just don't, they don't maximize, you know, they're just, they, they're suppressed and they don't ever reach full potential. And, that's one of the things that, you know, we've really struggled with here, like I said, is when you go from not enough uh, to too many for the amount of food you have, you got to really do something pretty quick or, or you run into an, an issue. Mm -hmm. And here, man, it's, you know, food is, food is, uh, it's, it's king because, you know, these deer are in the edge of the Ozarks here, man. I mean, we, we deal with it all the time. I mean, but, you know, really all they have to eat here outside of if you plant food plots is rocks and acorns. I mean, I tell people all the time, like they're just, there isn't a lot of available food, you know, um, and, and, and the wide open timber stuff is even worse because you don't have no low brows. Right. So it's, it's, you know, you're, you're running into a, um, a deficient, uh, a deficiency on the nutrition side and, and it just, it really suppresses antler growth. Mm -hmm. what, what's your primary metric for that? I mean, is it exclosure cages on your food sources? As far as what now? As what far as it? like monitoring, you know, uh, density, like, uh, yeah, amount of deer. What, yeah. What you yeah. So we run a, we run a ton of browse cages and it's, it's been pretty incredible to see that because it, it, it tells you so much about your herd. I mean, from, you know, how your food plots are, I mean, and, and the quality of your plots to how many deer there is, you know, to what you need to do on the density side. I mean, it just, it really gives you a lot of indicators to, uh, to be able to, to manage a better herd. Hmm. When you, um, when you guys did your cut and stuff, was that something that you kind of walked into from like a complete property side, Randy, or did it, would, did you section it off? Like, what was your approach there when you said, you know, Hey, we need to, we need to do some serious cutting on this property timber wise. Yeah. So, I, you know, I'm a big believer in, you don't want a monoculture, right? So as many habitats as you can get, um, the better for wildlife from a mm -hmm. wildlife standpoint and also um, the age of your timber. So I didn't want to go in and just cut everything at once and have, you know, 
a timber stand across the whole property that was the same age. So I went in and actually broke it up into different sections to where we're going to have a lot of different stages of timber growth. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, like I said, like, I think, I think the more that you can mix it up and, and the more you can, you know, you can do that. I think better off you are as far as from a wildlife standpoint, I, I hate, I hate having everything the same. I mean, no different than when we walked in and everything was big, mature timber, right? Um, the same way. I don't want to have it. I don't want to have the whole thing a clear cut either. So, and you know, I've really went into and kind of strategically put in plots and then we'll go in even with our clear cuts, our, you know, and, and make micro bedding areas, you know, close, close by those food sources and stuff and really structure it that way to where, we can kind of put them where we want them and, uh, and get them on those food sources, uh, earlier in the day and, and make it where they don't have to travel as far, you know, to get there. Are you guys doing any burning? <clears throat> we haven't done a lot of burning yet. We're trying, we're still trying to get kind of our road structure in place. Um, that's kind of been the last piece of the puzzle. And once we get that done, we'll be more set up to be able to easily burn, you know, because then we, instead of having to go in and, you know, push fire breaks on every burn, we'll kind of be able to use our road system mm -hmm. as, uh, as natural breaks. And it'll make it, it'll make it to where the whole farm is, is broke up into seven or eight, you know, burnable tracks. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and we'll be able to do that pretty easy. But I, I do, I do love the idea of burning. I, I like, I like that a lot. And I think it's definitely something that we'll implement That's interesting. going forward. Yeah. We, we've, uh, recently, like I, I've been experimenting with it in our farm, which is more hill country. So it's tough. We don't have like, you know, it's, there's no need for a road system, like on every field edge necessarily. So we're having to disc in brakes and stuff, but we had a lot of success last year. I think, uh, we went in like in October when a lot of those fallow, uh, or not fallow, but, uh, what do you call it? Jeremy is a fescue. Uh, yeah. Fescue, the grass, yeah, fescue grass. Essentially it's like a, a cool season grass. Yeah, it's, it's pasture grass. It offers nothing in terms of like nutrition or habit. It just like lays flat basically. Yeah. Um, it's good fawning like in the spring, but, but that's about it. So right. Once all the broadleafs go dormant after like a few frosts. So like in October, we went in and sprayed like life they sprayed all of the grass there and then burned it off in February. And then all the broadleafs were still there underneath and they sprung. And I mean, stuff that last, you know, the, the October before this past, like so 2022 was like, I don't know, six, eight inches tall right now is standing like five, six foot tall of broadly stuff. And I, we didn't plant anything. We just burned it off. And that's what came back. The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Hoyt Archery. Oh, dude, it's almost fall. You and I are both going to be in a tree stand with brand new Hoyt bows. We're going to be shooting the RX-7 carbon bow this year. I know Hoyt's also got the Venoms out, both equally smooth shooting, quiet bows. Heck yeah, man. And we got a convert on our hands this year. We got a lifelong crossbow guy with a vertical bow in his hands for maybe the first time ever, a good friend of mine. And uh, we've got them all decked out with uh, the inline accessories uh, from the QAD integrated ultra rest uh, to the quiver. And also he's got the SL sidebar mount with a couple of stabilizers from Hoyt as well. So that's going to be a sick shooting bow. Yeah. And Hoyt's been cool enough that anyone listening to this can save 20% on any of the soft good apparels online using the code Hunter, H-U-N-T-R, no E. Uh, and if you want to look at the latest lineup of Hoyt bows, check out your local Hoyt dealer. Get serious, get Hoyt. We're, we're just talking about burning. Yeah, I was telling you, we, yeah. we sprayed off our cool season grasses and just and burned in February and like all the broadleafs under underneath. So 2022, the stuff that was like six, eight inches tall, like in October, right now is like five, six foot tall. Like Gosh, it just blew dang. me away. We didn't plant anything. It just like the broadleafs that come up underneath. So, I mean, it's structure. That's hey, awesome. 10 more acres. We're getting ready to burn here next, next week. Yeah. I it, really love it for, for, uh, turkeys too, man. There is nothing better <laughs> than a good burn for turkeys. I, it just sucks them in there like none other. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I think that's where like when you, I, I mean, obviously you see more of the burning happening in, in open areas, CRP grasses and stuff like that. But you know, it's probably one of the best tools in woods, especially like a post cut. I mean, think about just years and years of leaf litter building up on those forest floors and stuff like it's it's creating like an impenetrable shield to get down to that, you know, soil level and that that new seed bed. I have not done that yet. A timber burn. That yeah. truth. It, it's intimidating. It's for a, a lot of people. Yeah. 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 I mean, you, just, you yeah, got to make sure every cuts in. 
on the on the forestry side too and, and on the timber management side it's, it's it's there's so many benefits to it there too because especially like you were saying jeremy like here even where our basal rate is so you know yep. our forest is it, it's so thick and we've got so many little saplings and and smaller stuff i mean it'll just clean all clean that up, up too and and you got a lot less competition for your you know, for your nut bearing trees and then also for your money producing trees that you're wanting to grow. Yeah. Well, I think the cool thing about, I like, I, even though like we bought a place in Illinois, like m historically, like all my properties are, are timber pieces. Like that's what I bought. And like, you know, really it was this Ohio piece that I bought that kind of let me in on the timber side of this game. And like from an investment side, I mean, traditionally, mostly most timber pieces are cheaper per acre than open ground you know, whether it's right. pasture, especially ag, it's but true. even pasture. So, I mean, from when you talk about that hybrid hybrid mindset, Randy, of like, I want hunting, but I also want an investment, you know, with today's land prices, it's tough to, to beat a timber property with good timber. Now that's, that's the asterisk on it, right? Because there's a lot of people will say, well, man, I've got great timber and you come out and it's, it's not good timber, right? Yeah, that's a hundred percent. That's a hundred percent right. And because the fact of the matter is, is most people before they sell it, they want to recoup as much money Absolutely. as they can, plus get the land value, you know, so they want to cut the timber. And, and if it does, if it did have good timber, you know, they're, they're, they're pocketing some pretty hefty money if it's got the right kind of timber on it and then still you know have a great value and and be able to you know recoup a pretty high land price off of it too by just selling yep. the ground afterwards yeah yeah but I mean, the problem is the the problem is with the with the new owner you know if you buy a property like that you're going to buy it cheaper but then you're not going to have much return you know on your money at that point yeah that's a big piece. I mean, when people are starting to look at land like that, um, and listen, it, especially in today's era, it's few and far between that are going to have like good marketable timber, like out of the gate. Um, you know, we yeah, know a lot right. of, the, we know a lot of timber guys, like guys like Ben rising who are like, man, you know, you find a property that looks like this, like you best buy it up because they don't exist very, very often anymore. Yeah, that's right. And that, that's why we got lucky, you know, buying the Raven the way that we did. Cause like I said, I mean, it was kind of a needle in a haystack, but we we had actually looked at a different property close by, and that was the entire reason that we didn't buy that property. Um, mm -hmm. Is just because it didn't have as good a timber on it, hunting wise. Like it was, it was way further ahead than the Raven, you know, hunting wise. But we knew that, you know, if we bought that place and then interest rates rise, like they, you know, if, if they raise like they they have in the last couple years here we're going to be in a bad position and thank God now looking back on it, that we didn't do that because right. it would have been a bigger investment without no return on it, you know, cause it was the timber on it was to your point, just like you were saying of, of it not being ready whenever, you know, most cases, mm -hmm. whenever you buy it, it needed 15 more years on it. So you really got to look at that man from an investment standpoint, when you go into these properties, because our, you know, how much interest in that 15 years before you can get the, the timber cut on it, yep how much that's going to eat you up. And, you know, now whenever you're talking about borrowing money on a property and, and, and spending eight to 9% on interest, I mean, if you don't have no return on it, man, and you don't yep. have the, the pocketbook to hold it, I mean, it'll eat you up. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to see that. I mean, I know, you know, at least the last couple of years, we haven't seen that kind of flip on the land side, but I, I would assume that there are quite a few people who bought land during that 2020, 21 time period that man, the interest rates are, are starting to creep up on them here, you know, and, and whether they refinanced, you know, like a, a year or two ago when it was like super low, then they're maybe in good shape, but you know, I think it's probably getting to the time where they're like, man, I don't use this as much or, you know, interest rates eating me up, whatever it is that we're going to see some properties come back onto the market. Now, whether from a timber standpoint, especially like I'm assuming with the timber prices, most people are cutting timber if they've got timber at this point. A hundred, hundred percent. Yeah. And you're exactly right too on that because, you know, interest rate wise, when you look at it, the, the problem is, is even, even if you bought or, or refinance whenever it's low most of the time on those land deals like that they're only giving it to you on an arm it's not you yeah. know it's not locked in for 25 or 30 years so um they they've got it they've got it figured out i mean they you, you might get you might get a lower interest rate for a little while but uh mm -hmm. they're they're in business to make money you know what yep. i mean yep do you see the raven as being a long-term project for you guys or something that you know you you 
kind of take it to where you want to get it and and look at selling and kind of doing it all over again? Man, I, it, that's a question and, and a thought that I have internally a lot. You know, <laughs> I, I don't really know. I, I don't know. It's it's uh it's been a heck of a fun project, and it, and we're not there yet as far as everything that we want to do. So I really don't have an answer to it, but I do want to get in to this type of 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 management and and practices with more properties than just here. I mean, we just picked up this past year, we picked up that new place in Oklahoma and mm. uh, we're kind of doing some of the same stuff there, getting it developed and stuff like that. And I really, like we were talking earlier, man. I mean, the older I get, honestly, I get more enjoyment out of that side than I even do on the hunting side. And I, I really find myself like that enjoying life a lot more whenever I'm out there and, and, and improving things like that. Like I get a lot of, yeah. I get a lot of, uh, I get a lot of happiness and joy out of that. I mean, I really do. So I want to keep doing it more and just kind of scale it from here, I think, and and uh, kind of maybe even turn it into a, some kind of a business at some point. Yeah, I think it's, you know, when you when you start to look at that side of things, there there's a couple different ways. Like, obviously, and we know a bunch of them, like there's a lot of consultants out there that, you know, come on, tell you how to do it and that kind of thing. The reality is, and, you know, being that I did that for a long time, is most of my clients didn't do any of the things I told them to do. And it was not necessarily because they didn't believe what I said as much as it was resources to do it and or time to do it. You know, and especially yeah. for the successful guys, like time was a premium for them. And so if it was like, hey, you need to take this time and do X, Y, and Z, they just, they didn't do it. Um, That's right. So yeah. these turnkey properties become more and more of a, you, you see it more and more people are, are getting into it and, you know, it's, it's really finding a property and uh, essentially it's raw form and then turning it into something that kind of bypasses the things that frankly, the three of us really like to do, but somebody else might just want to walk into and just be ready to kill, you know, big deer. And yeah, that's, ex that's, that's exactly right. And, and to your point, you know, you're exactly right because it, when you really think about it and you think about these type of properties, you know, it's, it's just like anything in life. I mean, it, it, we don't have to be doing this to, it, to be relatable, but you know, if, if you're a guy that makes the kind of money that it takes to buy, you know, a property that's turnkey or whatever, you got to put your time and your effort into what's making you the money and you only got so much time Mm -hmm. per year right so you're if you're a guy that has a great job or a business or whatever you're putting your time and your effort into what is making the money to allow you to have this place and you only have so much time so you got to pick out you got to pick your battles just like all of us do in our own lives so a guy like the three of us that you know love it we got the resources you know we got the equipment we got some time to be able to do it and we got the know-how I feel like there's a there's an avenue there because um, there's a lot of guys out there that, you know, they want to concentrate on what they do well every day and, and what's making their money. And they want to be able to go into these places and buy them and and just, you know, walk in and have great hunting. And there ain't nothing wrong with that, you know, but I think there is a there, there's definitely a business there from our side of the standpoint, you know, because that's where that's what I love to do. And that's what I really want to, I really want to concentrate on going forward. Cause I think there is a, a great Avenue there. Hmm. And it's funny. It's almost, it's hard to relate to. Cause it's like, <clears throat> what do you mean? Like, what do you mean? You just want to walk on the property and start shooting big gear. Like that's for me, half the meat on the bone is the projects to, oh, I to, know. to get there. Like that's, oh yeah. You know, yep. it's kind of relatable to the public land guy, right? Because the public land guy can't do those projects. He can scout his balls off, but he can't do those projects. So you know, it's a, it's an intermediate. That's why like a lot of times, you know, I think when you have a conversation with somebody who purely is hunting public land, which like Randy, like that's what I grew up with. It, it's wow. hard to relate because they don't understand why we would have passion for all of these off season things, food plots, timber yeah. cutting, whatever. But it's because like that is the 365 cycle that we operate as like a private land deer hunter. That's the whole deal. I mean, it's the work you put into it that gives you the satisfaction. So yeah, I do think that's, I see what you're saying. I think like it's different angles. Well, from, and, a, and I think everybody gets there. I think everybody gets their enjoyment too, out of, out of different things. I mean, yeah. just because the three of us <clears throat> love that side of it and that's where we get the majority of our enjoyment doesn't mean that, you know, Jimmy down here that, you know, owns a huge company, you know, he, he might find his enjoyment somewhere else but, but he might still like to have a, a nice piece of ground that's set up and 
to be able to walk into and, and do some hunts in the person, you know, really where they, where they see that from and get that enjoyment from. Yeah, for sure. I, I think it's okay. Yeah. I think it was a Riverside thing. Sorry, Randy. Um, yeah, I, I, you see what I'm saying? Like I do. Yeah. You're yeah. You're saying neither, you know, the, you know, wealthy guy who's going to buy a turnkey property or mm -hmm. public land hunters have the, the ability or the necessity to do anything to the land. They're, they're there to, to kill yeah. a deer. Yeah. Well, but I mean, the public land guy is scouting, right? His, his off season isn't food plots and TSI. It's scouting. Yeah. Or yeah. should be. Well, and it's not a necessity <laughs> too. Be. Like, he, well, just frankly, right. Yeah. You don't see guys that can afford turnkey properties on public land. No. Cause why would you? <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> I mean, if right. I, yeah. I mean, that's where it's, it's, it's kind of weird because I do think there For are, white tails, anyway. there are plenty of people that are buying properties that frankly don't have the time and it's going to just take longer to get their property to where they want it. And that's okay. If they enjoy that plant food plots and doing things like that, then, you know, great. Again, that's part of that cycle, but, um, far too often. And I mean, I'm not saying it's necessarily a good thing either. You are seeing just more and more people who are, are looking for a complete turnkey situation, um, to walk yep. into and spend to Randy's point, spend a little bit of free time they have hunting in, you know, a premium expectation opportunity. Hmm. Who are they? Yeah. Who are these guys? <laughs> I would say a lot of successful, <laughs> yeah. like city type guys and think of like, you know, some of our neighbors in Illinois, uh -huh. like they're not doing projects and sure. stuff. They're just coming down yeah. and hunting. Yeah. Some, um, you know, your CEOs of, of businesses and everything else that they, you know, they're spending all their, they're spending all the extra time when we're out there on the tractor, they're, they're making, yep. knocking down some money to be able to buy those properties. Yeah. But well, frankly, my wife bitches about that all the time. She's like, I can't believe like you're planting this. You dis for whatever, nine hours the other day. And it's like, yeah, I, I mean, there's a, there's a bit of tractor therapy in that of yeah. nine oh, hours yeah. of just, just going like not, yeah. oh, was it? Nine hours? Wow. It's a hard thing to describe to people. Like, um, cause like, obviously, you know, it, to a point, like we, we don't have normal jobs, but they're not like you know, we're not necessarily out there blue collaring either. And so like, there's a, there's a bit of like mental clarity and, and therapy of like doing just like hard work, like blue collar type work or working a tractor oh, yeah. or doing chainsaw and like just getting out there. I mean, it's, it's physical, but it's, it's mind clearing as well. Well, you know what it is, dude. It's like, uh, we're so, we have so many irons in the fire that like when you get the opportunity to do something that requires your complete focus. It's it's therapeutic. Mm -hmm. Like that's why when you take a break and shoot your bow, yeah, it takes all of your focus to yeah. to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. and, and you can achieve some element of that just going out and doing deer stuff too. I mean, focus mm -hmm. on your food. Like when you're planting your food plots yeah. and you're you know, oh dude, not nine hours not, of tractor time with like my AirPods in and just cranking music and just going is like. It's awesome. I love it. What's your good, yeah. What's your go-to playlist on the track? Oh, I've got. I'm a wide variety. I'll go from like you know '90s country to like 2000s like dirty rap. Like I'll wow, I'll, really? co I'll cover I'll cover the plethora, man. Like wow. whatever I'm feeling, you know. Wow. Yeah, you you don't want to get bored with any. You don't get bored with any genre. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I'm I'm all over the board on stuff. In fact, the other day I was. Uh, I wasn't doing tractor work. I forget what I was doing out on the farm. I was checking cameras or something. I had Sinatra going in one ear. I was really? like, yeah. It's just <laughs> straight crooning man. out there, oh. man. Felt classy. <laughs> <laughs> was that on a podcast or off? We were talking about doing mushrooms and going. <laughs> 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 wait, wait, when I, so when I was in the, the islands here the other day, Randy had some guy offer to sell us mushrooms or whatever. And I was like, no. But then here we were talking, I was like, dude, it would be a pretty spiritual experience if we could set our phones away and do mushrooms and go sh shed hunting for an entire day. Yeah. The, the problem was, Randy, <laughs> that we said that when we sobered up, we'd realize we were walking around with like a, just a big limb. Like we thought it was like a hundred and shed. A and it was, stick. it was really just a yeah. stick we were walking around beamer, with. Beaver off of a cow. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Last dinosaur lived right here. We'll, do it. we'll work it. We'll find time for it. Fine. <laughs> yeah, it, it is wild. I mean, I think that, um, well, dude, uh, first of all, like a property that big, I know your family farm is that big, but when you talk about like a property that big with timber, that thing probably feels like it hunts like 3000 acres. Oh yeah. Yeah. Cause ours, you know, our, our topography here is, you know, it's pretty rolling. We got hills too. So it's, you know, if you flatten it out, you know, just like a pancake, you run, you know, you run a roller over the top of it. I mean, it would, it, it probably would feel like it was 2,000, 3,000 acres. Hmm. 
That's yep. nuts. I mean, are you, so what, what was kind of the initial thought there in terms of like scouting? I mean, was it a lot of camera deployment? Were you on those ridges just trying to look for sign and betting? Like you said, you didn't have many deer to, to begin with. Yeah. So, you know, to begin with, you, you know, really anytime I go into a, a new property like that, I'll really study, you know, topos and stuff like that and just really start with features. You know, I'm looking for saddles. I'm looking for, you know, points, different stuff like that and kind of concentrate my efforts there. And, you know, even to the, you know, the development of the food plots and where we put those at, you really went off of, of, of the topography of the ground, you know, a lot in, in most cases. Um, so that's where I'll always start with, you know, on a new piece of property, just because mm. you can, you, it doesn't matter, you know, what part of the country you're in. One thing is that, that kind of stays true is, you know, how those deer will move um, accordingly, you know, to the topography yeah. and stuff like that. You know, if you find a good saddle, you know, whether you're in Southern Missouri or Oklahoma or wherever, Kansas, you know, you can almost guarantee during the rut, it's going to be a hot spot. Yep. That makes sense. I know, um, obviously from like our deer grow relationship, you also had pretty poor soils there, right? Terrible. I mean, I tell everybody that I don't know how you could get much worse than what, <laughs> where we started, because, you know, a lot of that, a lot of that had to do with number one, where we're at here in this part of the country, but also taking that property from a fully timbered property and then cleaning it up and making those openings and those plots. Whenever you take a, a piece of ground like that, that that has that dense of timber on it, I mean, it's just got the nutrients and just completely sucked out of the soil. Yeah. You know, when we when we started out, and and not to mention that you almost you you create more of a problem too because whenever you clean it up, what little bit of topsoil that you had there to start with a lot of that gets scraped off. So then you have to go back and you're pretty much building soil from the ground up again. Right. Um, as far as topsoil. But yeah, I mean, a lot of our, one of the first things that we did once we got them cleared was took soil samples and, and a majority, the majority of our soil here was running like from four, seven to five, two, <laughs> which is pretty bad. <laughs> That's you it. Know? Well, damn near Bernie, you put your hand in it. <laughs> it pretty acidic, you know? So, <laughs> So we went in and, and, and that's what I say, you know, it, with the deer grow stuff is it, it truly, if you look at our plots and you look at kind of our plot program from year one versus now, it's mind blowing. I mean, yeah. you would never think that you could have took those after what they look like from the ground zero point of year one and look at them now. And it's like, man, you guys can't be in Southern Missouri where it was completely timber because I mean, they look like plots that would be in western illinois or southern iowa or wherever you know i mean it hmm. just it's mind-blowing but it, it goes back to you know putting the right stuff and building that soil with the right stuff i mean between the you know the plot start and you know the boost i mean we're putting it on dry dirt you know and really pumping that calcium product with the plot start in there boosting you know giving it a, a instant boost in the arm as far as from a ph standpoint but then also really you know, allowing those plants and those plots to really be able to utilize every little nutrient that's left in that soil, we're giving it to the plant now and, and, and giving it into a way where we don't have to spend as much on dry fertilizer yep. either. Yep. So it's, it's been, it truly has been a game changer for us and, and our program here. The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Muddy and Stealth Cam Trail Cameras. Cell cams, cell cams, cell cams. What an evolution the industry has seen and we've experienced personally over the past five, 10, you know, whenever cameras were invented, right? It's like, man, it's totally changed the way that we inventory deer, pattern deer, and ultimately the decisions that we make when we're going out to hunt. They're a serious piece of the puzzle and, and uh, you know, that information is invaluable for us we trust the muddy and stealth cams you know together to be able to, to collect any of that information yeah i mean as an admitted trail cam addict you know i've definitely been guilty of of under hunting places or relying too heavily on that information that's come in that said it's an invaluable tool to the overall management plan and strategy that i have for my own properties or even hunting public land it doesn't yeah. matter we have a finite amount of time 
in going out and hunting. So when you and I are after a particular class or quality of deer, usually a mature buck, we can't waste time hunting an area where that deer doesn't exist. And those cell cams provide that information that allow us to spend the time in the area with the highest chance to accomplish our goals. I say it all the time, man. It can't kill them if they're not there. That's it. So right now, any of our listeners can use uh, code HUNTER20 to get 20% off either Muddy or Stealth cameras. Uh, we're certainly going to be taking advantage of that, and we hope you guys do too. Yep, check out Stealth Cam and Muddy. What uh, is the difference in, <clears throat> I mean, either of you can speak on this. You, you might know uh, the best. You know, so you're down, Grant Woods is down there, right? Yep, Grant's not far from there. Pretty close to where you're at? Yeah. There? Like the proving he's grounds? Just, he's just wet. So Grant is about, as, as far as north and south, he's about, the, he's about right where we're at, but he's about three hours straight west of us. Okay, and with similar but very, soil qualities? Very similar, very similar soil qualities and, and condition, yeah. Okay, so I remember, you know, just remembering back watching his stuff, he did a lot of, like, antler dirt stuff. Yeah, which is chicken litter. Okay, mm-hmm. and so, like, he tried to take more of an approach of, like, bringing in soil, Bringing in organic chicken litter to, like, yeah, to, to kind of stimulate that topsoil or what little topsoil he had. Okay, yep. and so, I mean, what... Which is better, I guess. Are you, I mean, or both? Would you rather yeah, have both? It comes into a realistic format. Like, first of all, to bring in triaxles <laughs> of, like, chicken litter is not going to be very easy to sure. do in most cases. In fact, I think, I don't know, Randy. Is it essentially pardon? topsoil? Like, No, it's, like, chicken shit. Like, from a, okay. from, like, chicken, yeah, yeah. you know, processing yeah. places. Okay. Yeah. And I know. And a, that, lot of, and a lot of what Grant, a lot of what Grant's doing over there, too, and, and we do, we do some of it as well here and doing more of it, but he, he's, he's really into the regenerative yeah. uh, farming as far as, as far as going in and um, hardly ever, hardly ever disking and working the soil. Like what he's doing is he's going in like the spring and doing a spring planting and on top of, well, we'll start out with the fall. Let's, let's yeah. say start out the fall. So he'll have like, you know, maybe a, um, an oat wheat mix with some, you know, brassicas, whatever in it. And then he'll, so he'll roll that through the, through the fall and the winter and then come spring, you know, he'll take a roller or a crimper and he's crimping that down, never turning the soil and then going in and, and planting the spring summer planting right on top of that. So when you do that three or four years into it and you have all of that organic decomposition of, of, mm-hmm. of that plant, you know, and, and organic matter building, it's just building on top of each other and building that topsoil up you know, a half inch or inch or whatever it is a year to where when you do that four or five years in a row, all of a sudden you've built yep. your topsoil basically by doing that. Yep. Yeah. That's to where when you piece. work it, when people work it in with a disc every year, you know, they're just turning it right into the, right into the, the little bit of soil that's there. It breaks down underneath the soil um, and rots away and you really don't, you don't get the benefit of it as much. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that's one where like, I know, um, and obviously some places are better than others, but like when we talk about like our brassica bulbs or those radishes and they put those giant tubers on that, not only aerates the soil, but adds a lot of organic matter back in. Now the problem with that is in a lot of cases, if you've got very poor restrictive soil, like where Randy is like, you can't put, produce giant bulbs and and Mm. radishes and stuff necessarily right out of the gate right because everything is nutrient restricted but if you can get to that point where you allow that to where we were talking earlier it's like that thing's hollow and it's rotted and it's breaking down like that's just going to add organic matter all back into that soil Mm. Um, yeah and that's i think too jeremy to your to your point there you know you're exactly right and I think a lot of times that's, you know, people, they, they spend a lot of money. That's just honestly just wasted because, you know, just like in our case, you know, until you really get the quality, you know, of that soil, right. It doesn't matter. You know, you can go and, and, and grab a whole, you know, gr- cart, a fertilizer cart full of fertilizer and dump it on the ground. And, you know, there's a misconception there of, man, the more fertilizer I throw out here, the mm-hmm. better that plant's going to grow when, that plant, you know, it, it can only it can only uptake so much of that fertilizer, depending on the soil, you know, the soil quality that you have to work with until you get the soil right. Like you got to start there and then go and then go on to your other, you know, your fertilizers and stuff like that, because if not, you're just you're putting a lot of a lot of material out there that's not you know, in, it's not plant available. Yeah. So one of the things, and obviously I'm not an agronomist, but, um, we're coming out this year, Randy, probably in March, 
Um, and I don't know if you've used any from Steven and those guys yet, but we've got three liquid fertilizers that we're going to be coming out with. And each of those, um, you know, Hunter and, and Colton and those guys have really been educating me, but each of those basically going through is that from a dry fertilizer standpoint, uh, only about 17% of that can be utilized by the plant in year one. It just takes mm -hmm. multiple years. So even if you put whatever, a hundred pounds of nitrogen down, the reality is, is that only 17% of that or 17 pounds is going to be used in year one. And then year two and year three, it'll break down the rest. The liquid fertilizer, which will be applied on a actively growing plant, so not on bare door, dirt like your dry stuff, but actively growing, is 90% available. And so essentially when you're applying whatever, you know, 100 pounds of nitrogen in a liquid format, 90 pounds of that is available to the plant right away for growth. So you're talking right. about that. And it's, you know, the problem is, is that as a society, right, we want instant gratification. And so when you get back into that, like adding fertilizer, adding fertilizer, it's like, man, I did that with my corn this year. We talked about how hard it was for me to grow corn. The fact was, is like, man, I was just adding nitrogen, adding nitrogen. And I'm like, this is like, it was painful. And then I'm realizing later on, like, well, yeah, I put 200 pounds down, but only 34 of it was available this yeah. year. You know, the rest yeah. is going to be broken down over the next two years or whatever. So yeah, that's a, that's Even, the stuff we don't, as deer hunters, none of us really like we're not taught that, right? We're not agronomists. We're not farmers. We're just trying to grow a damn food plot. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's interesting, and and you know, obviously, kind of you know, being introduced to well, really, we started using the deer grow stuff about the time that we started with the raven, and it's yep. been so it's been cool, kind of learning that process because it's it's new, right? Like everybody's kind of accustomed to the dry fertilizer and the dry ag lime and stuff mm -hmm. like that, but when you everybody's about convenience and it doesn't get much more convenient than like the deer grow products. And even for us here, you know, one of the ways you're talking about um, using it like post germination and that's how, you know, we'll do as far as on the boost, you know, we'll go and wait until that plant gets five or six inches, you know, four mm -hmm. to six inches, something like that to where it has a lot of, uh, you know, leafage on it to be able to, to suck that that boost down into it and we'll go right over the top of it and spray it yeah and it's you know within a couple of days i mean you, it's like day and day and night difference yeah um and and the deer will you know it really greens that plant up makes it more palatable and you can tell a huge difference in in how the deer react to them too yeah i think it's it's when you get into a lot of this food plot stuff and, and you know guilty myself of like over analyzing a lot of it you know the fact is is that you know, there's a baseline of staples. Like I know Jared and I have gotten back to planting a lot of clover, um, <clears throat> recently that we, for whatever reason, you know, we, whatever, we just kind of shied away for it or, or went away from it. And then clearly it was like, man, not only was that like a key staple is like the amount of pressure it could take, especially on a small plot and the attraction it had during the season and, and all the protein it provided, even in the spring and summer, it's like, and that's a tough plot to beat. I, I feel pretty good about like, finally, I feel like I've got a nice system where it's like, you know, you got to have clover and cereal grains are like kind of a, a staple and they're mm -hmm. very browse tolerant. Mm -hmm. Brassicas on anything like an acre and a half or bigger, depending on your, you know, is, is going to be a good, mm -hmm. you know, November and on food source. And yeah. then in my opinion, you got to have a destination grain, mm -hmm. you know, five acres or more. So Randy, how many acres are you planting now on your place? On on the place in Missouri, we plant about fifty. Wow, um, is what is what we got here. And what, and I and I try to mix it up. Okay, what's that? No, that's what I was going to ask you. What are you planting? Yeah, so we we don't we don't have any huge fields here. So for us, it's hard to plant grains because they get and we have a hog problem. So mm -hmm. um, so corn corn and beans are tough because we don't have any fields that are that are over you know four acres or so. So the beans with our deer density, I mean, they just hammer them down. Um, and then the corn, like last year, I tried to grow some corn here and we grew it pretty well for, you know, for where we're at. Yeah. And the then mountains. about August, man, the, the freaking hogs rolled in son. And it was like, you set off an A-bomb. I mean, they, there's a stage in that corn where it starts silking. Yeah. And during that silken stage, I don't know what it is, but the hogs just go crazy over it. Wow. And, uh, so we pretty much lost all of our corn that we planted last year, but we, we try to, we try to mix it up though. Just like you guys are talking about clover. I love clover, uh, for a couple reasons, you know, one, I love to hunt over early season 
it's a great food source uh, early spring. You know, when there's not a whole lot of natural browse popping, that'll be the first thing that pops kind of kind of gets them over the hump, you know, mm -hmm. to a certain to a certain degree. So I, I love that about clover. Um, so we'll plant, you know, and the other thing about clover is, too, is if you maintain it, that's less acres the next year that you, you got to exactly. fully go in and, and work and yep. and plant. So it saves some time, too. But we plant a lot of cereal grains um, and then mix it up with some brassicas, too. I mean, that's pretty much what we run. Mm. all of our all of our mixes you know we plant big time stuff and it's a it's a good combination of of cereal grains and and brassicas so and i would assume you're treating those clover so those clovers are essentially acting as your destination type plots right the the ability to have those as perennials through spring and summer yeah i mean we have we probably plant um i try to keep it probably 20 percent. you know so mm -hmm. you know on that i mean we're planting around 10 acres, give or take of, of clover. And, and that way we've got something pretty much 365 days of the year on the, on the place. And those deer are living pretty much on those plots year round. And then, you know, obviously when you get in, on into November and stuff like that, they'll kind of, they'll kind of move off of those yep. and, and move more into the cereal grains and, and the radishes and, and stuff like that. So there's certain times of the year that we'll hunt over them, especially early on. And then, like I said, though, it's just, they're, Clover to me is way more important than just a, just a food source to hunt over. You really get the benefit of it, you know, that early part of spring because mm -hmm. it's just the first thing to start popping when, when nothing else is really, really growing yet, you know, and there's yep. not a lot of food available. It's, 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 it's clutch. Yeah. yeah. The cereal grain will do that too. Like a, a winter wheat or a, a cereal rye. Like dude, this past yep. week here, I'm sure that stuff all grew an inch. Yeah. Pumped. Yeah. Yeah, that was yeah. big. No, it, it grows it grows a ton, but there's something about the palatability of that clover early on that they mm -hmm. they really I feel like they prefer even over the the cereal grains. Yeah. So I mean, I would assume you, you know you talk about at one point in time like having a low density and then building that back up. Like now, I mean, you really don't want a ton of summer food, really, right? I mean, because ultimately that's that's where you're gonna pile in these deer and pile in these does. You'd rather kind of prioritize it towards those fall plots, which is obviously in tandem with the season. Yeah. Yeah. To a certain extent, but also, you know, now that now that of kind of where we're at density wise, like the last two seasons, I mean, we've really, we've really shot the heck out of does and trying to bring that, trying to bring that number back because I, I still want my deer, you know, I still want the majority of the deer that I'm trying to hunt and grow from year to year. I want them spending as much time as, as I possibly can yep. here. You know, I, I want, I want them to call this home instead of me, having to rely on and take the chance that they're living on my neighbors 90% of the time and only spending 10% of the time here. I mean, number one, they're not going to live as long that way. And yep. number two, it's going to make it, it's going to make it a lot harder to kill them. Um, so I, I want to give them what they need here and then adjust the density to, to where they, to where they have something to be here and stay here. Are you keeping a lot of those bucks on the ground? Like right now, like looking for sheds and stuff here in the next few weeks? We, we are, we are, I would, I wish that, I wish that we didn't have the hogs because I feel like once it gets like deep into that winter and we don't have grain, we lose, we lose, start losing a lot of them and they start spreading on us, yeah. but then we'll get them, we'll get them right back. You know, we'll get them right back come early spring. With but that clover. We do yeah. right around, right around shed, you know, shed drop. We do lose a lot of them because that's like that critical time when they're really running out of food and yeah, uh, food scarce. That's that seems to at least from my end and when I'm looking at like my properties that are big timber is that's the toughest part is like you know I don't find a ton of sheds because frankly I don't have a lot of food at that time usually and the deer then aren't yeah. there. You know it's just that's the reality of timber. Now obviously those deer are going somewhere right. There's a pile of sheds somewhere. It's not like they're migrating 20 miles away, but they're not specifically on my property maybe it's because the neighbor's feeding or whatever like you know they're just not there yeah that's exactly right because that time of year man i mean that's the most critical for them to stay alive so they're going to go they're going to go wherever they can where they can eat and where they have some food for sure mm -hmm. and like you're exactly right like the big timber stuff is always the toughest places to pick up many sheds because they just simply aren't there that time of year when they're dropping them that's it and that uh hogs is one thing it's i'm glad we don't have yeah like that's oh. they're in ohio now I mean, par parts of it yeah mm -hmm. dude is there not dude, you is talk there, about a pain in the butt man is there not a it's, way it's, to like poison them like some kind of <laughs> mass eradication not, 
<laughs> not legally. I've, I've said forever, if, if someone could come up with, with some kind of birth control powder yep. that they could put in the corn, mm -hmm. I mean, in all honesty, I think that's the only way wow. that you're ever going to be able to to, we probably to already used it on our own is, citizens is, is at that point. If that was, if it was actually something out there, that they would eat that most other species will not. Well, they make like a, they make like what is it, like a slurry mixture of like, uh -huh. like it smells like stinking rotten corn type thing that would keep okay. most of your other things. Away. Like at least I know that's what they use in Mississippi all the time. Okay, um, and mm -hmm. then they would put that in like the. Did you ever see the big circle traps? Yeah, that they like yeah. corral traps that they yeah. you know so they would put that in there and like most of your deer and stuff don't want anything to do with it. You get the hogs in there, right? And then it shots. But I mean, it's, yeah. So we have a state, yeah. we have a state trapper that comes here, and uh, I don't let him trap during hunting season because we're trying to hunt. I don't, I don't really want the traffic in and out, but mm -hmm. he's probably caught. I mean, on our place, I bet he's caught seventy or eighty. Holy something like cow, that. man, that's crazy. But he that's that's what they use too is like the huge drop traps yep. and they'll, you know, they'll bait underneath them. And then, um, yep. the ones that he has is just got, they've got a manual trip wire. Yep. So he'll corn all underneath that trip wire and they'll get in there rooting around and hit that trip mm. wire and pull a pin and the whole trap will drop down. I, Jeez. I, 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 you know, I don't know. Somebody can laugh at me for asking this question. Why can't we poison them? Like if the if they're the only ones that will eat mash, I don't well then them. not not all of them. I mean, you still have other like coons are going to get into it, possums are going to get into it. Like I mean, no. you're trying to isolate it basically so that deer. That's what aren't. I'm saying. Is there something that only hogs will eat? Like it's no man. I don't know. I I don't know solely if they. You know, it, I okay. don't know. All right, I, I think coons and next question. Then do we care that we also are killing coons and <laughs> possums? Does anybody care? No, not really. Probably not. Okay. Uh, I don't think any of the sportsmen. I don't think any of the sportsmen really do. I mean that that loves uh that yeah. loves you know their turkey population and their yeah. their deer population. It's a shame that you can't legally do it. I mean because honestly, that's you know it would it would definitely help eradicate them. You know why the biggest reason is no is what I talked about earlier. It's because people's dogs and stuff will get into it and then you'll start killing. Mm. Well, that's puppies. a problem. Yeah, you don't, yeah, you don't want to do that. Well, well right. Right. <laughs> yeah, you don't want that, right? That'd be terrible. Yeah, that'd be horrible. <laughs> what? Yeah, don't do that. Yeah. So I don't know. I so mean, you can't it, poison them. You can shoot them from helicopters, but well, not, not, not in, in timber country. Not in timber country. It's it's you those trap corral them. traps and and drop traps and clover traps. It's just the problem is is they reproduce so fast. So as fast. Well. Yeah, it's yeah. crazy. Like they, they have, start, they start reproducing at six months old, and they'll have three litters a year. Yeah, I mean it's you, you can't seems keep, like you, the ticket. That's you what, can't keep up with them. No, or birth control, and then like an aggressive. Yeah, part. if you could get something that would sterilize them, you know that you could, you know, a powder form or whatever that you could mix in with the corn. Like I truly think, if somebody was to come up with that, they would be billionaires. Yeah. My gears are turning. Mm -hmm. hmm. It's always it always comes down to the non targets, right? It's like what non target animals are going to get affected. I by don't think anybody this. cares about coons and possums. I Were think, you? Well, I, I think, I think too with some of that. It's some of that poison too. Like you know, it kills so far down the food chain that. Yeah. You know, the hawks and the eagles and stuff like that. I know at one point that's what mm. they were they were talking about, really worrying about because it, you know yeah. you poison you poison a possum or a. Yeah, you know, a hog it. or a coon or whatever, and then an eagle gets it, and that, well, that's a bad deal. Also, yeah, I mean, right. there there are a lot of people that eat wild hog. So, you, wild hog gets poisoned, then human consumes it. That might not be. Well, good it either. doesn't poison all wild. It's got to be a quick death. Okay, I, ideally a spontaneous combustion. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, they yeah, like it, it, and then they evaporate. Yeah. <laughs> then all we're killing yeah. is turkey vultures at that point, of which again nobody cares. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it is. It's it is that that kind of constant like going through yeah like you talk about the eagles and hawks with like the mercury levels in fish and things like that like people get it is that trickle effect to where has there ever been like an intentional mass eradication of an animal species like an invasive like hogs has that ever happened i mean we're we have a war waged on feral hogs right now i know. It just is not we're losing right <laughs> we're losing yeah we're definitely losing and coyotes would be another coyotes one coyotes would like be a, another one an man. invasive and it's like can't keep up with them either. Yeah. Yeah. Seems like we're pretty ineffective at like targeting invasive species of animals. Once the cat's out of the bag, hard to bring it back in. Yeah. No, the hog thing is is wild though. I mean, they they um 
you know, even like in, in Ohio, there's people that I know could wipe out 10 hogs that may be like the only 10 in that area, but they won't because they're like, oh, these will be cool to hunt. The moment you think that, they've the population's tripled and you're screwed at that point. Dude, talking about hogs and, and crazy ways that they, they were introduced. So talking about all the hillbillies and the rednecks right here from where I come from, a lot of these hogs right here come from there was a huge ring of deer hunters dog hunters that got caught here a few few years ago and they lost their hunting privileges so the only thing legally that you can hunt in missouri at the time without a license was feral hogs Mm. so these guys were turning them loose around here and then able to legally you know hunt the hogs and all of a sudden the population here just exploded. So wow. they created a little bit of that that we have right now that we're dealing with. So hmm. uh, it, it was the it was the like the hillbillies and the rednecks that like to run their uh, their deer with their deer dogs. That's crazy, man. And and it is um, you know, and you start to hear like you know whether they're scavenging or whatever. Like there's plenty of people who've gotten trail camera pictures of hogs with fawns in their mouth. Like whether that fawn was dead and they scavenged it or they actually did kill it. Like who the heck knows? But yeah. like you know, it's 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 a major problem. I mean, property destruction wise, like even up in um, like the Smoky Mountains, up like in Gatlinburg and stuff. I mean, they're ripping that that those forests oh, yeah. and those parks apart. Like it's crazy. <laughs> Um, Root and turkey nest up. I mean, they just they there's no good that comes out of them. No, and it, the weird thing is, is like you can't eat them, right? Like, yeah, guys, so, lots of guys. Well, eat but what was interesting is, um, you know, when we had Allie in, like that's what I, she's like. Yeah, we won't even like got them. We won't touch them anymore because they're so riddled with diseases and stuff. Is that like, just in Florida or everywhere? I would assume that. I mean, Ever, they're, they're dirty, dirty. What? Yeah. What's the? Wow. What's the? I forget what the main disease is on them. There's Was some trigonosis. Yeah, trigonosis. Yeah. Hypnosis? Yeah, not that. <laughs> Hypnosis. <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah, they, I mean, because at one point in time, I knew a lot of guys, they'd be like, oh, you just got to make sure you have, you know, rubber gloves and doing this and whatever. But now it's like, you know, people don't even mess with them. Maybe that's what's wrong with me. I've skinned too many of them hogs. I got Probably, something. man. Yeah. I got something within. Yeah, something I, Ajax won't take off. I remember the first one I saw in Mississippi. I was all up in bleach. there and cutting and stuff, and they're like, "You're not wearing gloves." I was like, "No, I don't wear gloves when I'm gutting." They're like, uh, "Yeah, hogs, you should." I like a little bacon <laughs> grease on my fingers. I like pull my hands out, my skin's just like melting off. Ugh. The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Muddy. Man, Jared, we probably have been using Muddy products for at least ten years now. It's a long time, dude. It's been a long time, and I can remember when it was simply just safety harnesses and camera arms of all things. And you know, that's evolved to where you and I both have a bunch of Muddy box blinds as well. I would say a bunch, but yeah, they, they've come a long way, and certainly the box blinds are are huge. Shot that buck over your shoulder out of a Muddy box blind a couple years ago. The harness and, and all of the other safety accessories really are are a major component of of what Muddy offers for me. Um, you know, we've had some injuries in the past, you know, some, some tree stand accidents. This, this is all back before we were using, uh, you know, frankly, harnesses, mm-hmm. uh, the lineman's belt while we're hanging stuff and the safe lines. I have those in every single one of, uh, you know, our fixed tree stands now. And uh, so we really have made safety a priority. Uh, that, that's a big deal for us. And, uh, you know, Muddy has everything we need for that. Yeah. And I think uh, the cool thing about Muddy is anyone listening to the Hunter podcast can save 20% using the code Hunter20. That's H-U-N-T-R-2-0. Uh, anything that you can see on the Muddy Outdoors store online, use that code, save yourself 20% for this hunting season. Go Muddy. What is the most effective way? Is it, was it with traps? I would say so. I mean, helicopter I, stuff and thermals is, is a, a pot, but not in like timber country. I think traps you have to have, it's, it's just like anything. Like obviously Randy, you're a huge trapper. Like you gotta have, a, it's gotta be passive. Like it's cool to go out and shoot coyotes, it's not an efficient way to control the coyote population. No, and the thing about hogs is too, man, they're so they're so spookish and, and they're smart, you know. So you the problem is you go out and you know, you're shoot you're shooting in these sounders of hogs, you know, there might be, you know, fifteen, twenty in a sounder. Yeah. And you pick off two of them and you scatter them, you know, you scatter them here and yonder, and all of a sudden, you know you do that two or three times and they're so educated and you've only, you know, you've really only picked off a handful of them yep. to where, you know, if you're using huge drop traps, you know, sometimes you're catching the entire sounder in one drop. So you get that whole family group 
and get those eradicated. And then you go set the trap on another one. And, you know, that's really the only, you know, even semi-effective way I feel like. Well, and Randy, you said you've had a state guy there. I mean, I know that there's some private groups that do it, but I don't think it's, it's not cheap <laughs> to, to do it. No, it, it's, it's not. I mean, that's, that's the good thing about the, you know, in Missouri, we have that program through the USDA yep. and, uh, and, and then the conservation, you know, they're, they're a part of it as well, the conservation department, but you know, those guys will come in and, and they provide the, you know, all the corn and the traps and everything. I mean, you don't have to pay anything. They do it. You know, yeah. it's all, it's all, I don't know if it's federally funded or state funded, but it's got to be one or the other. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's government funded for sure. Hmm. Yeah. It's crazy to, to think that. And I mean, it, it, you know, I know it continues to just expand their range, uh, into the whitetail range They you know, it used to be really held down in the South. Now it's just slowly trickling. Okay. So what, what if you could create, it, uh, what if you could create a, a poison, a batch of poison, some like, what if you could breed like something that would only kill pigs? Like it's exclusive to like mm. their DNA or something. And then you can just put feed out and whatever eats it is fine. I mean, it'd be awesome if you could figure out what that was. Like, ra like Roundup, basically. Yeah. You know, it's like yeah. selective to a gene or something. So I knew a guy one time, I won't mention their name, that uh, in order to try to kill a sounder of pigs, use that mash. A stick of dynamite. <laughs> and well, it was 50 pounds of tannerite. Oh, nice. Um, okay. It. it did some damage. Oh yeah, yeah. But also, uh, the uh, ATF showed up because really of the explosion. Is that that's a lot of tannerite? It's a lot that's of a tannerite. Of yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that'd be the only place besides Vegas that that pigs really did fly. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. I I think I'm onto something there. If they, if they could like engineer some sort of like f tr food or poison that o only would kill pigs. Mm -hmm. So what, what else is I'm pig? trying to think of pi pigs are, are they ruminants still? I should What's that this. like kangaroos? No, no, it's like deer. <laughs> oh, <laughs> ruminants, Marsupia. cows. I'm not sure how their stomach structure Yeah, is. I don't know either. Like that would be, cause that's a big piece of it. Again, when you start to look at like the, the way that it would affect, um, their digestive system essentially. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there's got to be like scientists working on that or like considering it. I think it's a big enough problem. I think right? it is. The problem is, is I think that the, the, these conservation biologists over the top. And I mean, they have a point, a small point, but like it's the trickle down effect of yeah. like, if all these, no, it's a point. All of these that. pigs are dying out in the wild, then there will be scavengers feeding on them that then will potentially have an effect. Right. That's so, why you need something that it won't affect them. Yeah, but I think now you're into the, I'm going to introduce something that's not native to kill something that's not native, and now they're both in the system. Well, yeah, but it's <laughs> not like a uh, predator. Like, it's sure. something that once the Tyrannosaurus. issues... Tyrannosaurus. Once the issue's addressed, you remove them. Yeah. You remove, you'd stop poisoning. Yeah. There's no point. They're dead. Jared, Jared's going to end up creating something like COVID-19 in a lab. Yeah. He's like, I got I got to I got to rip China in on this. <laughs> yeah. Hey. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Uncle Joe, let me ask you a question. Where can I get some bats? <laughs> I think, I think Jared, you just need to take a trip to Wuhan. And yeah. Probably, you'll find, um, they got it over there. Up in the yeah. Uh -huh. You probably yes. could create a pretty good import export business with dead hog carcasses to China. Mm. Oh, a hundred percent. Say, Hey, we don't have to eat <laughs> cats and dogs anymore. She's yeah. all like pigs. That is. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is sweet and sour pork now. How about that? Man, I'm hung up on it. I got to believe there's hey, a way. In all reality, talking about that, it's funny that you say that because we were, we were with a guy the other day in Oklahoma and uh, we were running hogs and he told me that he had at one point, he had a hell of a business selling all the wild hogs that he caught and killed to all the local Chinese restaurants. Oh, I bet, so man. Oh. You, you've probably you've probably eaten more wild hog in your day than what you even realized. No wonder wow. I get the shits all the time. Hmm. Wow. That's it. That all makes sense now, huh? Yeah, it's all yeah. it's all coming together now, boys. Ugh. There is something to that. I mean, we've got health inspectors, and we ask them, sure. like, hey, where's the worst places to go? And they're like, you don't want to eat Chinese food ever. I like it. I love it. <laughs> I had some last night, honestly. <laughs> yeah, I got low main in my belly right now. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, when you there, there probably is pig. a way to 
you know, um, feed because they'll eat anything pretty much. Okay. Like feed them something that would attack certain parts of them. But the problem is, is like, could it actually be isolated to just pigs without trickling down the food chain? Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it's possible. They're not ruminants. What are they? It says here they're pigs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, so there you go. So they only like, got one one chamber in their stomach. So if you fed corn, like, and you could figure out something around there. And Randy, the funny thing is, is like there are probably like anatomy people listening to this. They always write us, and they're like, "You yeah. guys are idiots." Yeah. We have no idea. <laughs> we have no idea what we're talking what about. I have doing? a problem hey, looking for a solution. <laughs> yeah. Side note. We are not claiming to be uh, swine experts here. No. Yeah, we were. I, I think at one point we were talking about um, like uh, cr uh, creating trauma with a broadhead and like hitting the lungs and right. stuff. And there was literally like a couple guys, which I thought was funny. They were like listening to our podcast while they were like in the operating room, like doctors. And they're like yelling <laughs> at the podcast because we were so wrong about it. Yeah. Got to focus on the patient at that point. It, <laughs> it's funny how angry, you know, certain things make people that whenever yeah. we're not all 100% right, you know. But it's perfect for this because if somebody listened to this, they'd be like, no, you idiots, this is how you would kill all the hogs. And we're like, great. I would there love to know. Yeah, yeah I mean, perfect idea. Somebody has like an explanation or has tried, attempted anything <laughs> on their own. We'd love to know. Yeah, off the record. Yeah, we won't tell you. <laughs> you know? I, I think, uh, I think I heard one of the colleges is working on, working on something right now. I forgot forgot if it was auburn or uh where it was but i i think i i want to say i read something that one of the colleges maybe lsu it might have been lsu one of the one of the more popular colleges though in the country um thinks that they have something figured out with hmm. the with the feral pig situation yeah i mean it it's uh it's a large enough pro i i remember seeing because the biggest um the biggest impact is on the agricultural side of things right right so on, yeah, on the massive crops create millions, millions millions and millions of dollars. of dollars yeah throughout the entire delta and stuff that is where <laughs> that's where this is really and frankly we we talk about like all the public sectors and stakeholders in it that group at least usually has the ears of most politicians as well so if there is something that's going to work they have a chance to implement it because they're going to be yanking on the ears of the right politicians to get it done right from us from a hunting side if we said well we could do this they don't care what we say yeah it doesn't matter yeah. right we're not pulling enough weight sure. there well that's why i'm saying it sounds like there may be a college that's on it but like yeah somebody's got to be looking at that mm -hmm. that's a multi-million i'm pretty sure dollars. i'm pretty don't hold me to it i'm pretty sure it's lsu now mm -hmm. that i think of it nick sounds right yeah nick, nick lsu Sardu. or uh yeah lsu hog poisoning see if we can find something out there yeah yeah i mean i i think that um you know, and that, to be honest, Randy, it's, what's kind of cool is I think from all of our discussions, like you're the first one that's really talked to us about a managing a property in hog territory. Um, yeah. You know, and, and that's something that a lot of people listening to this haven't, you know, they don't even have to deal with. It's not even a, a thought on their spectrum, right? And it really, yeah, it really restricts, like, it really restricts our ability to do certain things that I would like to implement, but you simply can't, you know, because, because of that situation. And, to be honest, like anybody that's been around in hog country too, like they'll be the first to tell you like hogs, you know, everybody talks about like cattle and how cattle and deer affect each other, but it has nothing compared to hogs. Like they do not like to be around them, you yeah. know, yeah. um, they clear fields. See I've seen What's that. They'll clear a field. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. They, they, they cannot stand to be around them. Mm. I thought I thought that was right. The old tigers. There you go. Sounds that sounds, sounds delicious. <laughs> <laughs> like Can a you little, imagine a little how salty much pig? That, oh, dude! Like how much money that's going to generate, though? Um, unreal amount of money. No, it's it's does huge. It, does it say like what this what stage they're in? They'll be. There'll be many parts of states, though, that just smell like dead fish, pigs. Fish oil? <laughs> yeah. Like, it's just going to be dead pigs. I everywhere. can't wait. <laughs> That's crazy. What have you seen, Nick? It, it hasn't been approved by any. The FDA? Any what's, your, what's your estimated time of arrival? Detonation. <laughs> <laughs> is it like a recent publication, or is it just like a... 
Yeah, that sounds right. Okay, so it's just a popular article. This was in 2015. Oh, okay. wow. I have a feeling that something fell through if it's not out yet. Here would be a That's second. Nine years, got shut down. Nine years ago. Yeah, it, it may have been something that, like, they killed a bunch and then eagles ate it and then they died. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Oh. Oh. Oh, gummies. Wow. Yeah. Better watch those college Dude, kids taking those, level. too. You don't, yeah. want to, you don't want to get them. Yeah, this, it, this isn't though. laced with uh, p- pig uh, yeah, is fentanyl, this, is, is it? Is it fentanyl? No. <laughs> Damn, I'll tell you what, though, that patent is probably worth a fortune if it works. Oh, my gosh. No telling how much. I'm pretty impressed that they decided that they were going to make gummies out of it, though. <laughs> yeah, that's next level. <laughs> <laughs> Just give me, give me powder or something. I bet, I bet uh, they I mean, would eat it. Anyways. Oh, yeah. Do you ever see a wild hog eat gummy bears? Yeah, it's pretty pretty destructive. That's funny. But that's yeah, nice. man, it's... Here, here it's, would be... I know, we need to move on from this, but, but here would be a secondary proposal. We'll find some <laughs> way to get them to ingest uh, an explosive like <laughs> that somehow <laughs> stays in their stomach. Like an M80. Like it's based on gum or something. <laughs> and then... Like at a certain temperature. It, like a ticking time bomb. Yeah. Well, or at some point we just, if, you know, if Trump gets reelected, we let him hit a button at one oh, time. And then he would love it'd to It'd be like a national well. event. He'd love to. We terminate the pigs. This is amazing. Pigapalooza. Pigapalooza. The, it was huge. Explosion <laughs> was huge. Yeah. yeah. That'd be my secondary proposal. After poison. Poison. Yeah. Seems I would say it would be based on the temperature inside the digestive tract of the pig to explode. Okay. Yeah. You say? There you go. Yeah. Watch out, LSU. Coming mm-hmm. after. We're you. coming for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, um, I think, you know, I look at a lot of the people in the South that I talk to on that, you know, and you mentioned Oklahoma, Randy, like most of those guys, especially where they're feeding and stuff, they've got, you've got giant, uh, cattle panel type setups to protect the feeders from, from those hogs getting in. Yep. That's exactly what we've done down there. I mean, we had to basically, you know, build exclusion cages around the, around our feeders because I mean, when they, you know, the pigs come in, I mean, it'll, it'll completely ruin the whole feeder. I mean, they'll just they'll quit using it. So, Jeez. um, we've went in, I mean, it creates a lot of extra money and a lot of extra time, but you know, we had to do it down there on, on several of them. Hmm. Yeah, and I mean, uh, you know, it's one of those things that I assume that once you have them, I mean, you can lay, I'm sure, like, have you guys actively, besides the state, like, have you as a group said, hey, like, we're going out and we're going to just try to kill a bunch of hogs? We have, but I tell you, man, it's, it's not an easy, it's not an easy task. Uh, they're, like I said, they're smart, they smell good, they got very good noses, so it's, I mean, it's it's tough to, it's tough to really make a dent of any size in them. I mean, at, you know, in, in Oklahoma down there, we've, we've hunted them quite a bit with thermals and stuff like that, but it's still the same, still the same deal. I mean, you pick off a few, you know, out of a big group of them and, and that's really about it. And then you don't see them for a couple of weeks. They, they kind of scatter and, uh, it's just, it's just hard to ever make really a a very big uh, impression on them. Mm. Yeah. I mean, and that obviously, you know, has to, play in like you said you know the grain stuff you know you gotta avoid doing certain things i mean you got to change your entire management plan based on you know what your situation is Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah that's exactly right i mean i it's aggravating man because there's a lot of stuff you know that i think is is important you know just like the corn and the beans and stuff i would love to have a mix of of grains in our program here especially for you know late season and holding our deer in the winter and stuff like that but it's just it, it. We're just not able to do it. Yeah. Um. So what? Uh. Wrap up on this side, Randy. So, uh, you guys are what season of of the Raven are we into now? Man, we're getting ready to uh, be in the fourth season of the Raven Project, and then on the Headhunter side, we're getting ready to air our fourteenth season. Believe it or not. Wow. Wow, man. So, yeah, it's been a while. It's crazy whenever I think about it. I mean, it's it doesn't seem like. Seems like yesterday that we were, you know, just kind of coming out with it and starting headhunters, and here we are, fourteen years later. Time flies, man. And so, where are you airing headhunters at right now? We're still airing headhunters on um, on Outdoor Channel, you are. and then we're also okay. dropping some stuff over on on YouTube. We're we're starting to pick up our YouTube side. Are mm-hmm. are getting ready to start 
kind of pushing that side some. So it's uh, headhunters underscore TV is our is going to be our YouTube and the, channel. And then on the Raven stuff, you guys, I mean, you you kind of lay it out, I guess, what, like chronologically a little bit there, right? Throughout the year and kind of what you're doing, different projects on the on the property and obviously the hunts included in that. Yeah, we kind of keep it as semi live as we can, you know, as close to the time of of uh, of shooting it as we can get it out. It usually it usually drops, you know, two to three weeks behind. So whatever we're doing, whether we're hunting or working on food plots or whatever, it'll drop two to three weeks behind that. And, and we're airing that on, you know, Waypoint, the app over there and then also on YouTube. Very cool. Awesome, man. Lord. Well, cool, dude. Well, we appreciate you coming on and, and talking to us. That was that's cool. We we definitely want to stay in touch here as you kind of do some more work on the on the farm and and watch the progression of that, especially into the fall time frame. But um, man, it you know cool to to hear you kind of take something in such raw form and you know really be able to dive your passion into Admirable. it. And, Sounds like a tough yeah a tough project, but between the pigs and the soil <laughs> and yeah and the uh, age class of deer, yeah, I mean it's a, it's a big, a big it's, thing to take on. It's it's been fun, man. I'm always up for a good challenge, so it's a uh, it's been a lot of fun. I, I really get a lot of enjoyment out of it. But yeah, man, I appreciate you guys having me, and and hope we can do it again. It was fun catching up and just kind of shooting the breeze. I love it. That's it, man. That's all we do is just kind of quick and dirty talk. <laughs> so as long as you can keep your brother and Hosey in check on that farm, I assume you'll have a pretty good season. That's that's right. Yeah, that's my, that's the biggest uphill battle right there. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, awesome, dude. Well, we appreciate you coming on, man, and look forward to talking to you again here soon. All right, fellas. Appreciate you guys. Take care. The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Sever. Well, one of the biggest things that we always talk about is what our arrow setups are. And this year we're shooting the Sever broadheads. I think we're both shooting the new two inch titanium broadhead. And so, you know, we're huge proponents of expandables. And I know we've had this argument back and forth with people, but we just- We're we, right and you're wrong. And that's, you just need to accept it. We just want to have a giant wound <laughs> that pumps out blood. That's the bottom line. We build our arrow setups and shoot bows, you know, to maximize penetration. And we shoot broadheads that are going to give us the best blood trails, you know, the most hemorrhage possible. Uh, and so part of those setups is we're also shooting the Eastern arrows here coming up pretty soon. So we've, yep. we've shot the victory in the past mm -hmm. and you know, there's all kind of great arrow shafts on the market, but like we're looking for a whole system from broadhead to arrow components to the arrow shaft itself. And uh, you know, the more we look at some of these Eastern shafts and the components that go with them, that setup's going to be really deadly for us. Yeah. I'm actually using the Eastern traditional axis right now uh, in my traditional setups for both my recurve and my longbow. I've got a hundred grain brass insert on this. Those, and then obviously I'm using a fixed blade broadhead on on those specific shafts. Right on. So, but yeah, our goal is always to be shooting the best broadhead that we think is going to be the most lethal for our setups. We've done plenty of research. We believe in the Sever broadheads, and we hope you would check them out at Sever Broadheads as well. And awesome. Yep. Cool. I mean, uh, definitely. Well, first of all, need to see him take that that tracked, um, you know, it, it's funny cause we talked to Madison and rising and these guys and it, you know, not downing them, but it, it definitely seems like it's super few and far between of like a good timber property anymore, you know? And for, if Randy found a 1200 acre one, like, geez. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's, you gotta be, there has to be a market for it there. So, and there is most of, uh, well up until recently, I think you know, up until the last year or two, most of the bourbon barrels came from White Oak in Missouri. Mm -hmm. That's yep. that was yeah. The so I mean, it sounds stave like, logs. You know, there's substantial money to be made there. Yeah. Well, there's a like any you know, you know any uh, element of value on a piece of land is like it comes down to what your seller knows about it and what your buyers and that's knows it. and it's, is it's looking for unrecognized value is what yeah. it comes down to. Whether that's deer hunting or timber, like. Those and are the and that's not to say, like, make sure you cut your timber before you sell. In fact, for a lot of our sellers, like, I recommend, like, I, depending on the value that's theirs, I, I wouldn't. There's no, because we're building into the price yeah, in a yeah. lot of cases. And it's not 100% translation. It's not like sure. you get $100,000 in timber, you just tack that onto your sale no. price. There's, a, there's a, a factor there, but. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But it's, it's, so it's interesting to see that. And then you dive into the hog problem side of things. And, like, I can't imagine. I mean, I've got a tough enough time keeping plots with, just deer, let alone hogs in there too, ripping them apart. I know it. They're, yeah, man. I just, I don't know. 
<laughs> I w- yeah, I wouldn't want to deal with that. That's uh, tough. Well, especially if like I could, it'd be cool if like it was like yeah, you shoot them and you can eat them, and like it just became another cool source of like hunting and food. But like, sounds like nobody wants to eat these things anymore. Yeah, I know. Which is like, yeah, that's an issue. What do they do in Texas? I mean, I know they do flyovers and stuff. They try, but. A lot of trapping. A lot more feeding, too. I assume you can feed in a way that the hogs can't get to it. Yeah, so that's what we're talking about. They're building those, um, like the what they call it, horse paneling, but it's just like big, yeah. um, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. four hog, by eight. Hog paneling. Hog paneling. That's what it is. And they're building those around the yep. feeders. Deer will that's jump right. into them, but the hogs can't. <laughs> that's right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, crazy to think of, of that kind of lifestyle. But I've seen it when I was hunting in uh, Mississippi and Alabama. I'd be in a, on a, you know, just a green field and during hunting season and that, that there'd be 30 deer that just, and you're like, what the hell? And then here comes the sounder. Wow. The hogs come out. You're, I guess that's what they call a group. Sounder. Of pigs. Mm-hmm. Sounder. Um, I guess, uh, there are some in Ohio, like. Yeah. Not, Southern Ohio Adams and stuff. No, like fairly close to like Yellow Creek. Oh, really? Uh, somebody told me that. I don't know. I know. I think Adams has them. Adams County. Um, I don't know where else. I've heard of them in Meg's, but I've never seen one. Hmm. Uh, but if they're there, they're going to keep blowing up. They'll keep exploding. Yeah. It'll always be an issue. That's what it is, I guess. I mean, we're dealing with coyotes. So, I mean, you just kind of yeah. find a way to. Yeah. Wolves, wolves, hogs, coyotes, bears, like um, cougars. Malta flora. Yeah. <laughs> Malta flora Like, it's all all in the same bucket, ultimately, the the day in the life of a deer manager. It almost seems like we just cause more. Our pigs, where do they come from? Like, nat- natively. It was uh, domestic pigs. Domestic pigs. Boy, just seems like people, we cause more problems oh, we than we Oh, we screw so solve. much shit up. It's ridiculous. Hmm. Wuhan. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, take, we'll take some blame. Not for COVID, but for, <laughs> for, for, peg, for pegs, I guess. But. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a lot of stuff. Well, and, you know, to the point of, like, how do you control it? Like, we've introduced a lot of things non-natively to control one thing that have then spiraled out to screw something else yeah. up. Yeah. Side effects. Yeah. So... But anyways, uh, cool to see um, that property taking form. Uh, I would encourage people. Obviously, I'm sure a lot of people listening to this have seen Headhunter TV over the last almost 14 years now. Um, check out the Raven. There's some cool stuff there. It's it's neat to kind of follow that that management side of things of what Randy had and what they've been developing and building. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a cool. Anybody that really likes that management side of things, I think would really enjoy following that progress and learn a lot of stuff. I mean that the timber game. <laughs> is probably one of the biggest things that, you know, I think a lot of us are maybe unsure of. And so it's like, what can I do? What should I do? Should I cut it? Should I not cut it? Um, you know, you talk so, to professionals what you should do. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> like it's, it's without a doubt. Find I mean, a private forestry consultant. Yeah. You know, and, and I say that lightly too, because like, um, obviously we know a lot of buyers and stuff, but a consultant is going to have your best interest in mind. I mean, that's who's going, they're going to get paid based on the commission of sale from your timber usually. Um, and so those are the guys that you want. You need somebody in your corner when you're looking out for that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, no, just cool, cool opportunity on that side. And, and yeah, I think Randy's, it seems like he's super happy working on that and yeah, he um, does. big, big passion. So it'd be cool to continue to follow along on that. Definitely. Yeah. Well, what are we at here? Jumping into March, sounds like. So yeah. So if you're listening to this, it is the 20th of February. No, it's the next week, 27th of February. So yeah. We are flying to Iowa. Yeah. Where we're at. Yep. Yep. You're, uh, yeah. Maybe if you're at Iowa Deer Classic, we'll see you there. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. But, um, please grab us too. We have people at ATA who are like, oh, we don't bother you. I'm like, you know, bother yeah. us. That's, what we're, that's what we're there at, for. I had the same thing at like uh, Great American. I talked to several people and then I had a couple people message me like, oh man, I saw you, but you were like talking to Cody at the nah, Lone Wolf. We're booth. coming to, like, we're coming to talk to you. So please yeah, grab us. That's fine. Uh, so, um, but yeah, we'll hopefully see you there and we'll catch you next time. Later. It's take me. Oh.